The very first scene we get to witness from the Boruto series is the complete destruction of Konoha, to which we hear a line that says the age of shinobi is over. These visuals and dialogue wasn't only true to the story, but it was also quite literally true to the Naruto fanbase. For them, Boruto marked the start of the end of this ninja story that they were no longer interested in, as they believed this series had done nothing but destroyed the legacy Naruto had left behind. To simply put it, Boruto was a sequel that should have never come to fruition. This was the first reaction to the series back in 2016, and now, 7 years later where part 1 of the story has wrapped up, this type of reaction still remains. Of course, there's going to be those who just hate for the sake of it, but it's impossible to deny that Boruto is not a perfect series by any means. Yet just because it has flaws, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not worth the investment. This is why this video exists. I've now had many years and countless rereads to sit more comfortably with my stance on Boruto as a whole, as while it definitely deserves its criticisms, I still found myself enjoying it more than resenting its existence like many others. And that's exactly what I want to share with you all today. Both the lows and highs of this journey as I'll be covering every single arc in part 1 of the manga, while also mentioning a few anime only arcs from time to time and whether they enhance the story or not. I'm currently recording this video before a single chapter of the time skip has released, so if anything new unravels that I wasn't aware of before, then please keep that in mind. Since I am covering all of the Boruto story up to chapter 80 of the manga, do be aware that there's just so much to discuss that I may not be bringing up every little detail or going too deep into certain elements. By the length of this video, you can already see that it's going to be long enough, so if I do happen to miss any small details, then I'm sorry in advance. This intro is long enough as it is already. So, with that being said, let's at last dive in to the story of Boruto. The start of the Boruto manga is promising, but also quite worrying. We see an obvious leap in time where Boruto is more grown up, fighting a man named Kawaki in the remains of a destroyed Hidden Leaf village. It's a super engaging hook to the story, especially with Naruto possibly being dead, as you're just eager to read more until we're back to Kid Boruto. But not only are we back to Kid Boruto, we're also back to covering content we've already consumed before. You see, the Boruto manga manga doesn't start with fresh content. Instead, it decided to cover the content that we've already seen in the Boruto movie released a year ago at this point of the initial chapter release. For me and many others who had seen the Boruto movie, this was extremely frustrating. Because not only were we not getting anything new, but we had to wait at least 10 months to finish this arc due to the series being on a monthly release schedule for its chapters. Now, I understand not everyone had seen the movie first, so it wouldn't be fair to say everyone felt this way. However, I did, so I feel like I still have the right to be annoyed at this decision even though I recognised they wanted to cover quite literally all of Boruto's story from start to end in this new series for him. But in turn, it kind of makes the sneak peek at the time skip a bit… scummy? Like the author deliberately made this decision to show off more exciting content because they knew if they started off the series with just a movie arc, then people would instantly drop it and probably forget about the series due to how long it would take to move on to the next arc. And who would even know at that point? if the following arc would be disappointing too. However, with that small piece of the time skip stuck in your head, it reminds you that there is content to look forward to, even if it is quite literally years away. And so honestly, the sneak preview did its job even if back then I was quite resentful about it. But looking at this movie arc after its completion, it does numerous things better than the actual movie itself, especially in the anime which I highly recommend to check out above all else. And while we're talking about the anime, it doesn't actually start on the movie 
arc, aka the Momoshiki arc, but instead has his own anime original content where Boruto is still in the academy and hasn't even graduated yet. There's some interesting stuff here like Boruto interacting with his Yuga side of the family and venturing to the hidden mist village, but while these concepts are undeniably interesting, the overall package unfortunately isn't anything to write home about. However, Sarada's arc and Mitsuki's origin episode are the best early pieces of content, as they're both proper manga content that Kishimoto worked on before the Boruto manga began its publication. Since these two arcs aren't in the Boruto manga however, I'm not going to talk about them since they were both written and illustrated by Masashi Kishimoto. While Boruto itself as a series is a completely different work with a different artist and writer as Kishimoto took more of a backseat as a supervisor. In fact, let's talk about that for a bit, because it's very important to discuss how Boruto essentially has two other people taking the lead rather than the original creator of the Naruto series. Starting off with Kishimoto, it's become clear through numerous interviews that the Boruto movie was his endpoint for the series. He stated he had done everything he wanted to at that point, and most importantly, I'm sure the guy just needed a massive break from a series he had dedicated his life to and wanted to try something new, which was exactly what he did through Samurai 8. Kishimoto has gone on record stating how he had always wanted to create a science fiction series, and with Naruto completed, this gave him an opportunity. So realistically, Kishimoto couldn't imagine himself taking the lead on both series at the same time, which is where Ikimoto comes in. Mikio Ikimoto was an assistant of Kishimoto's for the Naruto manga, working on the series ever since chapter 7, so he's pretty much been there from the very start. His focus was on background environmental art, but would also dabble in character art too, such as this page of Naruto's barrage of Rasengans aimed at Kaguya. After reading Boruto, I can instantly tell these Naruto's are in his art style, especially with the faces. Yet now for the Boruto series, his art would be pushed to the forefront as he would literally be doing everything art related by himself. And first of all, I'm going to say that I do really feel bad for Ikimoto. Because Boruto is still attached to the Naruto household name, there's automatically going to be a big reaction to seeing these characters drawn in a completely different art style. We're not used to seeing such characters drawn this way. So whether you think Ikimoto's art is good or bad, a reaction was going to be made either way. However, I will say that I'm personally not a fan of his art. While it does most definitely improve and there are some nice looking pages I'll make sure to show later on, at the very beginning of the manga, it is rough. There's nothing wrong with his environmental art which makes sense, but his character art is a whole other can of worms. The line art feels like the pen hasn't been lifted off the page to breathe until the full character is completely drawn out. His lines are also incredibly wobbly, especially around the face and hands, as it almost gives the impression that Ikimoto isn't confident with what he's producing. I think a lot of it comes down to how small Ikimoto draws character eyes compared to the big heads he gives them at times, which is the case a lot of the time for Boruto's character especially. Like I said, I'll be touching upon his art more as we continue throughout the story, but for now, that's my general opinion of it all. But going back to his specific interview is where we learned the unfortunate reasoning behind Ikimoto taking control over the art as opposed to Kishimoto. Kishimoto said he didn't mind the series continuing if Ikimoto was drawing the sequel, which is understandable because if you're looking at it from Kishimoto's point of view, this is clearly a guy who we trust to do a good job due to them working together from the start of Naruto. However, Ikimoto didn't want to draw a sequel in the first place, preferring to work on a reboot of Naruto instead so he could have been given more freedom and not forever bound to the original series. That's what he wanted and apparently Shueisha agreed, only for Ikimoto to be handed a script to discover that he was in fact working on a sequel instead. As he says, at that point he was too deep to escape, and it kind of sucks when you think about it, considering this is going to be his work for what will probably be the majority of his manga career similar to Naruto. I'm sure he doesn't hate it, but you can't help but think how he wanted to go down a different path. Working alongside Ikimoto however is a man named Ukiyo Kodachi who was in charge of the script. He had previously worked on the Gara Hiden light novel as well as the screenplay alongside Kishimoto for the Boruto movie. There's not much to say on him as of right now, but his contribution to the Boruto series takes a very unexpected turn a few years into its publication which I'll discuss once we arrive at it. But for now, this is what we're working with. A whole new team for a whole new generation. I thought it was pretty important to dive into this stuff beforehand so I wanted to make sure to get most of it out of the way before discussing smaller bits that add on to these elements later on. Now with this wrapped up, it's at last time we dive into Boruto's first major story arc. This is truly where the story begins.
So, Boruto. The version of Boruto many people know him as is this one right here. A bratty kid who's a gifted genius that complains about his father not spending enough time with him even though he still has a family at the end of the day. Boruto gets unfairly critiqued in this area of the story, and unfortunately it's led to people believing that this is Boruto's character through and through, right to the very end, when that's just not true at all. This is quite clearly an unfair resolution to arrive at, and it's mainly because this disingenuous narrative started from people not seeing this story through Boruto's eyes, but Naruto's instead. I would imagine that the majority of people have experienced Naruto before Boruto, and so automatically there's a bias formed where they take Naruto's side over Boruto's, whether this be unintentional or not. We took part in a 700 chapter long story following Naruto, witnessing all of the hardships that came his way and how he overcame such hurdles. So then when we look at Boruto, we're now instead following a bratty kid who doesn't understand what Naruto has been through. To those who side with Naruto, it can feel quite frustrating seeing his kid who grew up with everything Naruto didn't have simply complain about his dad not giving him attention. But you see, there lies the issue. Boruto doesn't know what his father went through. And even so, it's not like Boruto is unjustified to feel this way, as his character is shown to not be completely selfless either when he tells Naruto to make sure he shows up for Himawari's birthday, something Naruto fails to do even after his son reminded him how important this event was. Boruto is completely valid to feel such resentment towards his father. Simply saying, well, Naruto went through a worse childhood, completely ignores Boruto's problem and doesn't solve anything, just like how Naruto himself ignores it. It's almost like people who side with Naruto are unintentionally following in his footsteps with ignoring Boruto's position in all of this. Just like how the Hidden Leaf Village ignored Naruto despite his bratty behaviour even though we all know it was a cry for help. And speaking of Naruto, let's also tackle the criticism that has come his way because of how he acts. The fanbase will say Naruto should be all about family considering he knows what it's like to be alone. He understands that love is what can make an individual strong. While I do understand where this complaint is coming from, let's take another quick look at Naruto's character. Naruto does not understand what makes a family a family. In fact, Naruto has instead merged it into his dream job of becoming Hokage where everyone is considered his family and loved ones because those are the people he is protecting with his life. However, Naruto fails to realise how Boruto of all people is supposed to understand this. He's still just a kid after all, which explains why he uses Naruto's loneliness as a positive for Naruto's situation growing up. Because Naruto never experienced this type of love from birth and therefore doesn't understand what it's like getting it ripped from you. This all parallels the situation Naruto was in with Sasuke all those years ago, which is a nice bit of foreshadowing to show Boruto following in Sasuke's footsteps. But back to Boruto's troubles, it's a really great heartfelt talk as you can tell Boruto actually regrets what he says immediately after realising, yeah, my dad is actually alive. And you see, that's something Naruto also accounts for, that Boruto has a mother and sister there to look out for him unlike him who had nobody. But Naruto fails to understand that that simply just doesn't work. As someone who grew up with nothing would therefore know absolutely nothing about family balance. We all know Naruto has always been on that grind to continue working hard without ever wanting to take a break, and that continues straight into Boruto where we can see how unhealthy it's turned. He clearly values his job more important than seeing his family which explains why he sent a clone of himself to his daughter's birthday. Him not spending any time with his family at all should be enough of a sign to the reader that Naruto is forever stuck in an endless cycle of work, as Boruto's frustration is also another clear sign that this has been going on for years. As it's even mentioned ever since Naruto became Hokage is when he stopped spending time with his family as often. This then leads me to my final point on this topic as it's clear Naruto did spend time with his family back when his kids were younger, but obviously when the position of Hokage came he not only got lost between his job and family but he also failed to realise how Boruto would ever understand this. While Naruto is admittedly spending more time in a role that's keeping peace, at the end of the day, 
Boruto isn't thinking about the bigger picture like Naruto is. He's just thinking about the smaller things, such as his father being there for a simple birthday party. To Boruto, the smaller things is what means the world to him. But moving on from this, it's clear Boruto doesn't want to go down the same pathway as his father, meaning he needed someone else to look up to. This is where Sasuke comes in, being the perfect teacher for Boruto to get inspired by, because as I briefly touched upon, they're actually pretty similar in more ways than just one. But Boruto still has an attitude problem, especially when it comes to putting in the work. It's very easy for him to get inspired, but he only ends up getting annoyed when discovering that there are things that take time and hard work. And for someone who was naturally gifted as him, he wanted to get to the end result as fast as possible. For learning the Rasengan however, he's reminded by Konohamaru that there is no easy route, as Boruto quite quickly comes to terms with this. We then get to witness the boy who had everything gifted to him work hard for the first time to acquire something that was for once earned, as not only that, but he unintentionally gives the Rasengan his own unique spin to it, fitting for a genius who doesn't appreciate what he's been given as he hadn't realised how truly special this Rasengan variant is. Some things just don't change, this still being the case with Boruto's attitude as he quite literally throws away all of the hard work he's done when believing Sasuke was dismissing his Rasengan. Just like how Boruto always wants to jump ahead in things, he ends up jumping the gun in Sasuke's statement too, not knowing Sasuke was going to take him on as his student. Due to Boruto's resentment for hard work even more now, he then looks to scientific ninja tools to reach his goal for him to create a proper Rasengan. After accepting a tool to help, Boruto looks at his own reflection and notices how dirty he is from training, clearly not used to it, followed by him dusting himself down to be clean again, representing him going back to his old ways. This is the difference between Boruto and the road his father travelled down. When we see the side by side panel of young Naruto and Boruto doing the Rasengan, it's not to show how similar they are, but different. Naruto has a serious focused expression with his clothes tattered. From these visuals, we can tell how rough it's been for Naruto to reach this stage, but when we turn our eyes over to Boruto, it's the complete opposite. His expression is relaxed, able to smile easily after the fruits of his quote unquote training thanks to his scientific ninja tool performing the Rasengan for him, and of course, the very noticeable lack of any dirt on him whatsoever. What's interesting is that in reality, this should be a moment for us to say, wow, he's just like Naruto, but clearly he's not. The end result of the Rasengan being made is the same, but at the same time, it isn't. Sasuke even comments on this as he says, you seem quite different from Naruto. Sasuke wants Boruto to go down the right path, which is why he attempts to steer him down a road that will truly make him stronger. This is shown when he says Boruto should instead fixate himself on the Naruto of the past rather than the present to truly understand what makes his father so strong. Next up in this section of the story is the tuning exams, as it's one of the many things from this generation that we can see has changed drastically over the passage of time from the original Naruto series. It's nowhere near as harsh and life-threatening as the tuning exams we once knew, showcasing one of the most clearest looks into how much more peaceful the world has become, even when it comes to the battleground they trained their future soldiers on. This is a good and bad thing for the shinobi world, as while this creates a more peaceful atmosphere, it also severely weakens the next generation in the growth department if the time does ever arrive where action is needed. Speaking of taking action, when Boruto and his team fall straight towards a pit beneath their feet, Boruto gives up immediately as he doesn't even try to get himself out of this situation. Just like his Rasengan training by using a scientific ninja tool to assist him, he allows himself to fall into a deeper hole of not only insecurities, but regrets. Thankfully, however, through teamwork, Boruto's comrades are the ones to save him. But because he had already given up, Boruto doesn't feel satisfied with himself, showing some self-awareness with the position he keeps putting himself in. But that guilt was about to change into something that he must go through with, and unintentionally, it's all because of Naruto. When Naruto sends an email to Boruto congratulating him on passing, we're shown clear panels on how taxing this was for him to just send a short simple email. We all know this doesn't take much work, Boruto is also aware of this. Yet for Naruto, it displays how doing the most simplest of tasks that involve his family is something he finds trouble with. But as I mentioned before, Boruto always wanted these small gestures, as we see from his smile. The story is making us more aware how Naruto is really out of touch with things that should be pretty straightforward, from showing up properly to your daughter's birthday to congratulating your son in person. For Naruto, it appears being a father is the heaviest thing for him to balance alongside the role of being Hokage. After all, Naruto spent 
years preparing himself to be a leader. But when it comes to being a part of a family, this was something Naruto wasn't ready for. It's even shown when Shikamaru visits Naruto to inform him that Boruto, once again, has advanced to the next stage. Naruto is clearly confused however on that being the only reason he came to speak to him. Shikamaru's response is perfect. It's simply because it's important. This is a moment that actually clicks with Naruto, being the reason he visits Boruto this time in person. These moments are important, Boruto smiling bright with tears of joy forming from his eyes. It's a small gesture, but it shows us how much Boruto truly values his father's acknowledgement. He acts bratty at times in front of him, yet Boruto genuinely does love Naruto. Otherwise, this simple and small gesture wouldn't have caused such a reaction. While this moment should be joyful for the reader, taking a step back it's actually quite sad? This is the bare minimum Naruto needs to do to make his son happy. And clearly, throughout most of this story so far, Boruto has been extremely unhappy with Naruto's actions. This moment is a rare feeling for Boruto, which is why he cherishes it. Yet because of this, Boruto ends up being rewarded for cheating. Naruto unintentionally made Boruto rely on his ninja tool, because he knows it's his safe bet to get acknowledgement from his father. Quick and easy, just like how he's used to getting things in general. This then moves us on to the final stage of the tuning exams, and this section of the story is definitely better experienced in the anime. The manga essentially does the same as the film, which is breeze past all the matches. They don't give you a reason to care for them, nor do they really want you to. They just want to get as quick as possible to Boruto's cheating plot. For example, Sarada's fight is only one page in the manga, which is pretty disappointing. But meanwhile in the anime, fights like these are a lot more fleshed out to where they feel like proper battles. In fact, Boruto doesn't get caught cheating in his match with Shikadai like in the manga, but instead continues on to the next stage where himself and Sarada team up against Gara's son, Shinki. I do have a few things I want to briefly mention about Gara's son, but I'll save it for later. And because of how extended this section of the arc is, it gives enough breathing room for these side characters to actually feel like their own characters. For example, after Shikadai's loss from Boruto, we get a moment to see how frustrated he is from not winning, as it was something he genuinely put his all into. It shows an interesting contrast when compared to Boruto's situation, because not only did he cheat against his best friend, but he's also able to see how happy they are with the fact that they knew they gave it their all. While for Boruto, he's just stuck there. Not happy at all, even though it's his victory. In these matches, nothing was truly gained from them. Let's have a look at Boruto's cheating methods while we're at it. As during his first match, we see him taking out a normal shuriken, only to then drop it back into his pouch due to the fear of failing. This grip tight lock of not being successful continues to interfere with his growth, as he believes being victorious in everything he does is the only thing that would make his father acknowledge him. He takes the path that's guaranteed a victorious outcome. And we know this is something Naruto doesn't side with since he's already proved to people like Obito that the path he wants to navigate down is the rugged one. Skipping forward to when Boruto gets caught by Naruto, it's made clear that in this moment, Naruto chooses his job over his family by not accepting the fist bump, but instead gripping Boruto's hand to declare his cheating antics to the entire public. While Boruto did have this coming, Naruto's actions is what led to Boruto's downfall, therefore making Naruto himself fall with him, as he's pushed into the corner of declaring him no longer a ninja in front of everyone. The anime adds on to the reality of this situation catching up to Boruto, as we get an anime only scene where Shikadai calls out to Boruto in disappointment, asking if he cheated on the match too. It's such a brilliant inclusion as the guilt just continues to rise for Boruto, before eventually taking it out on his father, saying that if he had only spoke to him sooner, then he wouldn't have ended up in such a position. This is not only Boruto's awakening, but Naruto's too, snapping him out of his automatic work mode to understand the position he's always been in long before becoming Hokage. He's not just a Hokage, but a father too. A moment for this all to sink in isn't granted however, as we're greeted at last with the main clan of villains that the series will be focusing on. It was the return of the Yotsutsuki. While Kaguya's appearance in the original series was met with a fairly mixed reaction to say the least, the Yotsutsuki reappearing once more is actually a really great decision to expand on the shortcomings and lost potential of Kaguya. And as we get more answers, it ends up making the ending to the original Naruto series a lot more better thanks to the context we're getting. The reintroduction to this clan allows us to see what Kaguya said she was running from, as now her problems have caught up to this world. Also, 
the anime added another Otsutsuki member next to Momoshiki and Kinshiki named Uroshiki. But I'm going to be honest, it was such a wasted inclusion. There's nothing remotely interesting about his character and he gets killed by Boruto and Kid Naruto in the anime canon time skip arc later down the road. He doesn't change the story and just adds in some extra fights. Yeah, I don't think this was ever needed. But going back to the actual canon characters, Momoshiki's interest is immediately focused on Naruto and Naruto alone, which already reveals his character being fixated on the strong as power is what he needs, just like Boruto. Momoshiki in fact only pays attention to Boruto when he starts dishing out a bunch of jutsu stored in his device, absorbing them just like a ninja tool Boruto would be using. When Momoshiki's veil gets damaged, he immediately takes it off. As we can see, Momoshiki has a clean, elegant look to him. He's wearing all white after all. Yet this can be seen as a parallel to Boruto's clothing too. He likes to keep himself clean and wear clothes that make him feel new. We saw himself dust down after noticing how dirty he was from training, to then throwing away Naruto's tattered jacket, remarking about how uncool it is. And so here we see Momoshiki doing the exact same thing, getting rid of the filth to start anew. The parallels between them are already growing, being even more evident when we see Momoshiki taking pills that enhance his strength. He cheats the system to give him that edge. Boruto is looking dead in the face at another version of himself, which actually ends up being quite a literal thing later on when Momoshiki plans to resurrect himself in Boruto's body. Naruto then jumps in to protect everyone with the strength he gained and mastered through his own hard work. As Boruto gets to witness firsthand how strong his father is, being the embodiment of true strength compared to Momoshiki as Sasuke even states that Naruto is the strongest contender in this fight, but has to limit his actions to protect those around him. This all then leads to Naruto's sacrifice. As the aftermath of the battle settles, Boruto takes a good long look at himself to see what he's become uncool. This time, it isn't focused on the clothing being lame like previously, but instead on Boruto himself. His confidence is at an all-time low due to watching his father get kidnapped by protecting him. Even just looking at his scientific ninja tool fills him with resentment. He looks at it in disgust because not only does it remind him of his father's disappointment, but also of the supernatural being that's responsible for his father's downfall. It carries everything that stands against Naruto, both physically and symbolically when it comes to nurturing the growth of a shinobi. As we now see Boruto completely stagnant, not sure on where to go or what he can possibly do due to relying on another source of power to keep himself afloat this entire time. Sasuke however has faith in him. Even though Boruto is at his lowest point, he still believes he can pull himself up. It's also really neat how much Sasuke understands Boruto, especially when it comes to wanting to redeem himself as a true shinobi, as there's no better person than Sasuke to truly comprehend this feeling. Boruto then sets off with Sasuke and the five Kage to the final stage of this story to rescue Naruto. During this time, Momoshiki has been attempting to steal the Ninetales power, but it proved to be a much longer task than he thought. As Naruto says, we ninja don't like to make things easy. It's seen as smack talk towards Momoshiki who makes things easy for himself by doping and using powers that don't belong to him. Ninja obviously honed themselves through their own hard work, which is a tough yet rewarding task as the rescue group prove in this moment by coming to Naruto's aid successfully. This battle begins to take things up a notch however, as Momoshiki absorbs his comrade to evolve to an even greater level. We also get to see one of the first major changes the manga makes compared to the movie, as Momoshiki's evolved design is completely different. The manga design is definitely 100 times better as it's just more appealing to the eye in general. I can tell Ikimoto loved this design too, as there's a lot of detail he put into it. From the constant flow of hair strands to the intricate black markings. This cover page especially I just absolutely love, as Ikimoto's sense of style comes to the forefront in a very engaging and, for once, positive way. I also really appreciate the spacious paneling Ikimoto makes for his fight scenes. It gives plenty of room to show off all the dynamic actions taking place, yet for a monthly read, it's obviously a bit stressful at times because of how many pages it can take up to show the smallest of movements that only progress the story by a tiny bit. But 
but that's only a monthly reader problem, as when I was rereading these events, I found myself enjoying them a lot more compared to my first experience. And while this fight is great in the manga, there's just no way I couldn't talk about the stellar anime adaption of this battle that is the legendary episode 65. Whether you love or hate Boruto, there is a very high chance that you've seen this episode. I honestly can't praise this episode enough, as there was such a tremendous amount of passion put into this, and that's mainly thanks to the director of this episode, Chang Sing Huang. I'm really sorry if I butchered that pronunciation. I don't even know where to begin to show the dedication this man put into making sure this was one of the best episodes in the entire Naruto franchise. So down below, I've attached two videos that document some of the production leading up to the release of this episode. It's the best breakdown you'll ever get straight from the source, as I can completely understand why this entire episode was choreographed to perfection. Heading back to the story, the shared Rasengan is not only a great way to show Naruto passing on the torch and entrusting Boruto with the weight of what it means to be a full-fledged shinobi, but it's also a fantastic way for Boruto to grasp what Naruto had to endure to get to this point, as Boruto shed some tears seeing his father still being able to smile after everything. I do also like the detail the anime added of Boruto implementing his own take onto the Rasengan by vanishing it. I've also got to mention how much I adore this page of Momoshiki being hit by the Rasengan. This still remains today as one of my most absolute favourite pages from him as he brilliantly conveys the vortex-like blow he receives. This marks the end of Momoshiki, but also the start of some brand new content for the Boruto story at last. We see a conversation between Boruto and Momoshiki take place which never happened in the movie, which can give us an idea that the Boruto story wasn't supposed to continue or at least develop this way originally, considering at the end of the movie, there's no hints of karma or anything different after the battle. That's all just an assumption. This is also the point in the story where we get Momoshiki's warning regarding Boruto's fate, as it continues to loom over the rest of the series quite well to keep that uneasy atmosphere always present even after victory. Once the dust settles, both Sasuke and Naruto see the capable ninja Boruto has become, signalling a new start. This first arc is really fantastic, and I'm sure part of that has to do with it relying on Kishimoto's original story, but the Boruto manga and anime especially enhances it in many ways that it deserves its own share of credit. I don't really have too many complaints regarding this section of the story besides the shaky artwork, though there are some smaller things that annoyed me such as Gara's son Shinki. In the manga, they go out of their way to have a short introduction to his character while also acting like he was going to do something in the tune-in exam innovation before getting stopped. Even directly after this arc ends, we get more page time from him that just feels pointless. It honestly felt like there was possibly plans for him to contribute more in this arc, but it was all scrapped, making it feel like we saw the start and end of his character with no in-between. Maybe he does something of relevance later, but spoilers, this is the last we see of him in the manga for part 1. At least the anime tried giving him extra substance with his fights in the exams, but yeah, besides that, this arc is really great and I'd highly recommend the anime over the manga and movie. So, with the first section of the story wrapped up, it was at last time for us to see what direction this series would be heading towards with its fresh content. It was about time for a new beginning. This arc of the story is probably going to be the shortest to discuss, yet it's still important to take note of as it's not only the start of Boruto's more positive reception character journey, but also the beginning of his cruel fate with Karma. Thanks to the previous arc, Boruto has found his reason to work hard, as he sets his eyes on becoming a shinobi like Sasuke. I love the switch up in goals from not only Boruto, but Sarada, as it shows that they are their own characters and don't need to walk down the same path as their fathers. It's a great change to make their goals more interesting, and it's also funny to just imagine how Naruto and Sasuke feel about their kids following in their rival's footsteps. But for now, however, we get to see Boruto partake in his first solo mission, essentially a babysitting mission for a pampered kid who always got his way, something Boruto immediately shows disgust in. But Boruto is no longer his bratty self anymore, as his stubborn mindset isn't as persistent as it once was. Boruto understands this kid's way of life isn't fulfilling when it comes 
comes to getting things done with minimal effort. For Tento, having his dad pay for everything was exactly that, which still ended up leaving him with nothing on the inside despite how rich he is. Similar to Boruto who used cheats in his video games as well as with his scientific ninja tool, at the end of the day, he didn't really progress. Using the power you have and not someone else's is the correct play to feel proud and satisfied with the person you are. Because Boruto understands this, he becomes the first person to realise that this is actually a cry for help. As I mentioned before, this arc is mainly focused on Boruto learning from his mistakes and showing his growth by essentially helping out another version of himself that's represented as this kid. There's a few really heartwarming scenes of Boruto feeling sorry for him, knowing the exact feelings of going out of your way to do something different in order to get the acknowledgement from an individual you love. But instead of going down the wrong path to get this attention like Boruto did, he instead inspires and redirects this kid to not repeat the same mistakes, helping him achieve victory through hard work. Once the mission wraps up, both Boruto and Tento part ways, yet Tento finds himself in a sticky situation as he gets betrayed by his caretaker and kidnapped. Boruto happens to overhear a conversation regarding this situation and leaps into action, but informs Sarada that he can't partake in the new mission the team has recently been assigned, since rescuing the kid is a priority. There's a weird scene where Sarada bites her glasses and says, that Boruto, which I can't help but cringe at. In fact, let's talk about how Sarada is represented while we're on the topic. Whether you love or hate Boruto, there is no doubt within my mind that at least the majority of you have seen the large amount of controversy surrounding Sarada, more specifically her design. I'm going to be as blunt as I can be, but Sarada's manga outfit is downright horrendous. This is also supposed to be fighting attire, and I don't mean it in the sense of it doesn't look like something a ninja would wear. Naruto himself already broke that rule in chapter 1. What I mean is, does this kind of outfit really look like the type of clothing someone would wear when it comes to performing all of the dynamic actions a shinobi would do? It's just a short, tight dress. I don't believe Ikimoto's art style helps this look either, as his artwork is already fairly unappealing for a large sum of people, so he just ends up making Sarada look even worse. And I know for a fact that this is an Ikimoto problem, because the anime actually uses this design during Sarada's early academy days and it looks just fine. It's not short, nor does it look like it's suffocating her body. Also, the anime only has this design for a few episodes before switching to her original outfit Kishimoto designed. And so it begs the question, why? Why didn't Ikimoto use the original outfit Sarada was always supposed to have? The anime kept it right to the end, but Ikimoto never made that switch. Sarada, and I guess Sumire, is the only one that gets this change in design as well, which makes it even more coincidentally creepy. Her representation in the manga is definitely a questionable subject matter that I feel like you simply can't ignore no matter what side of the fence you're on. I'm certain part of this is down to his art style just not looking that great on younger characters, but it's also because of how he shortens clothing and the way he makes the girls pose. I don't like it, and I personally think the manga deserved the negative backlash that it got from this. Either way, this is the cards we've been dealt, and I feel like I've gotten my point across about my feelings on the matter. So with that being said, let's head back to the story. Meanwhile with Tento, his kidnapper insults him by being referred to as a bargaining chip and nothing more. Yet through Boruto's teaching, he understands that if he puts the work in, he'll realise his true value. Once he does get a grasp of his purpose, he attempts to take his own life to foil the bandit's plans, which can actually be seen as a parallel to what happens with Boruto later on between Ishiki, as he also tries to take his own life. Due to how much the story has been trying to reiterate how similar these two are, I wouldn't be surprised if parts of Tento's character foreshadows how Boruto will turn out in the future. Similar to how Tento himself follows in Boruto's footsteps with working hard and not taking shortcuts. Both are basically different versions of one another at different stages. To further back up this point, once Boruto engages in combat, the enemy knows Boruto can only use four shadow clones, counting down each one he takes out until only the real one was left standing. However, he ends up getting careless and takes a shuriken to the back, believing Boruto had an extra clone laying in wait, when actually it was Tento instead, symbolising how close to being a clone of Boruto he is. This grants Boruto the opening to finish off the bandit with one final Rasengan as the battle comes to an end. The anime version of this fight is pretty good too, even adding in some extra scenes to display how skillful Boruto is with the use of his Rasenguns. While we're talking about the anime, there's a few anime canon episodes that take place right before the manga content 
captain of this arc that follow Boruto, Sarada, and Mitsuki as they infiltrate a prison to essentially gain more information on the Mujina bandits. I think these episodes are fairly decent because they don't overstay their welcome while also being a nice bridge or build up leading us into the main juice of the arc. Going back to the end of this arc, we get a small tease to the mark left on Boruto's hand being connected to something much more than just Momoshiki. Before Boruto even realised, he was already linked to the next big threat. This was the organisation known as Kara. This arc in general feels a lot more like a setup more than anything. It establishes the new developed Boruto while also drip feeding a bigger threat looming upon the horizon. So while this arc isn't honestly anything that special, it doesn't overstay its welcome which results in a pretty quick few chapters and episodes you can fly by. So yeah, it's alright but I was still eager to sink my teeth into something a lot more grander. While this arc was most definitely a lot more on the smaller scale of things, especially when compared to the previous arc, what was about to follow would gradually put things into high gear, as a new world was about to open up for Boruto. The Owl arc introduces us to the central antagonist group Kara, as it quickly becomes a race between this organization and the Hidden Leaf to reach a vessel that has escaped from their clutches. The anime actually extends upon the lore for this group in probably the best anime only arc that has come out from the series, called the Kara Actuation Arc. While it does start out pretty uninteresting at first, things begin to really pick up towards the middle and especially at the end. This arc also serves as a training arc to fill in the gaps that the manga leaped over, which does result in some changes to the story beats that I'll mention as soon as we cross them. Two Kara members got time to shine in this arc despite one of them literally dying in the first chapter he's properly introduced in the manga, while the other member doesn't even exist. There's an anime original member which is an interesting decision to say the least. Makes me wonder if Naruto was being adapted in this day and age they would have added an extra Akatsuki member. But anyway, this arc is one of the more important anime only arcs that needs to be watched so I highly recommend it. Heading back to the manga content, the story tackles another change Boruto has gone through, this being his resentment towards ninja tools. And this is a great part of not only Boruto's character to explore, but also the usage of scientific ninja tools within this world. The equipment doesn't feel as one dimensional anymore because as Naruto and Sasuke say, it's not about the tool itself being bad, but more so how one chooses to use such equipment. After Boruto's fight with Momoshiki, he understands power that is nurtured through hard work is what should be used to protect the those around you, not through equipment. Whenever Boruto sees these tools, he's reminded of two things. His past self he hated so much and Diotsuzuki. This clouds his judgement as he refuses to acknowledge how the shinobi world has been evolving alongside technology. His heart is in the right place, just not so much his mind. Speaking of tools, we get reintroduced to Owl, a very good use of bringing back a character, as we'll see soon, who didn't really carry any significant value in the original Naruto series. Out of all of the characters who I thought would return in Boruto as an antagonist, this man was not on my list. Ao even has extra content in the anime with him visiting the graves of those who have passed from the war, interacting with Shikamaru and Ino since he was with their fathers when they all met their demise. It introduces him in a lot more sympathetic manner, discussing his regrets of being the only one to survive the Ten Tails attack and how he's trying to move on but can't. While the manga definitely relies on that shocker moment of seeing him for the first time on the train, I do prefer how the anime introduced him, as it gives hints to his weakness that Boruto exposes later on, as well as giving us more time to actually digest his character. Because in the same chapter he gets halfway introduced in, he already gets revealed to be an antagonist by the time the chapter ends. So again, another point goes to the anime. For right now however, Al represents the positives of what scientific ninja tools can be used for. Case 
point a prosthetic hand and leg. These tools aren't just solely used for violence like we saw in the first arc, but instead end up supporting the basics of everyday life such as simple movement. During this train journey, Boruto also learns that Ao is from the Hidden Mist Village, replying in excitement about how he went there on a school trip, referencing back to an anime original arc near the start of the series. Overall, I don't think this arc is that great and it can most definitely be skipped, but the final fight is worth a watch to see some cool Boruto and Mitsuki tag team action. Regardless of my feelings towards the anime original arc, I do like how the manga references back to anime only content from time to time to show that connection between the two materials. It's a nice touch and I'm sure diehard Boruto fans that love the anime appreciate it. This callback also helps to show how time has changed for Boruto's generation when compared to the past, as what was once called the Blood Mist Village due to its brutal and cruel shinobi training methods was now a regular hotspot for school trips. Speaking about connection to the anime however, the class rep Sumire also makes an appearance, who was once the main antagonist of the first anime original arc. Again, this arc isn't anything special, but I'm a lot more lenient on it since it introduces us to more of the cast and give these characters the room to breathe, considering the majority of them won't ever be of much relevance in the series again. But just like usual, there are some cool fight scenes, so there's that at least. Anyway, class rep turns over a new leaf thanks to Boruto at the end of this arc, deciding to be a part of the Scientific Ninja Tools team later on in the series, explaining why she suddenly shows up here at the doctor's lab. During Boruto's time here, he gets another glimpse at Scientific Ninja Tools being a necessity, coming across a ninja dog with a prosthetic leg. If Ninja Tools weren't allowed to develop to the point they're at now, the injury this dog suffered would be career ending, similar to our situation. Through some first-hand experiences, he eventually comes to the understanding that support can be shown in numerous ways. Boruto himself wishes to be someone who supports the Hokage, showing a connection between himself and Ninja Tools, bringing it back to one of the original core themes of Naruto with Shinobi being used as tools. But this isn't actually shown through Boruto, but rather through Ao. Boruto and his team set off from the lab after being informed by Naruto that Konohamaru has gone missing near the crash site that Kara is believed to be involved with. And as they leave, we get this really weird scene from Class Rep where she practically confesses her love for Boruto. It seems fairly obvious this was just an attempt to add tension to Sarada's feelings towards Boruto. It's really weird and, well, random, as it especially feels out of place for Class Rep's character. Thankfully, the anime completely removed this conversation. This strange, petty love rivalry doesn't go anywhere anyway. Continuing on, the squad eventually finds Konohamaru and the intel he gathered from the crash site he was at, but Ao has been hot on the trail, cornering them as his true intentions become apparent. I have to admit that it is kind of funny seeing a machine gun being whipped out as it's still referred to as a scientific ninja tool. To buy everyone some time, Mujino, Konohamaru's companion, holds Ao down by sacrificing himself. Now, you'll notice how I haven't spoken about this guy at all, and that's because he's honestly just a nobody up until this moment. He was a guy who happened to be paired up with Konohamaru and nothing more is said about him. His death is really boring and I know that sounds harsh but there's really nothing here to feel. It doesn't make the brutality of Ao's actions any fiercer as it ends up feeling rather empty due to Majino having no value at all to the story. However, the anime actually spends time giving him some anime original content to add more layers to his character, such as by giving him a connection to the third Hokage. The anime does try its best to make him an actual character, and while I guess it adds more value to his sacrifice since it makes us recognize Mujino as an actual living person who had ambitions of his own, this is still pretty much the bare minimum. And for me personally, I still didn't really care about the guy at all due to how uninteresting these anime episodes were. As Boruto and the others escape, we get some small downtime between him and Dr. Katasuke as we learn he was put on the Genjutsu at the start of the series, explaining his awful behavior towards Boruto when it came to pressuring him into using scientific ninja tools. In the movie, he was just a straight up evil guy. But the anime version does show small hints of someone interfering in the background to help show consistency to this plot point since it had to be changed when compared to the movie. After hearing Katasuke's story with full context, Boruto at last reaches a conclusion on the inner conflict he's had with ninja tools, shown by him acknowledging that the tool itself isn't where responsibility is held, but instead the accountability is held on the user. That's what makes a ninja tool good or evil. This is the moment where Boruto learns the proper use of tools, tying in this teaching perfectly with Ao's character that he had to confront to further prove his point. Ao does not consider himself a shinobi, only a 
tool that has no emotions, which lives solely to fulfill the role they've been handed. Yet back in OG Naruto, these were the exact things that would make someone a shinobi, which was exactly what Al was attempting to run away from. The battle that plays out is fairly average, but it has some smart plays, like forcibly making Al grab the broken chakra sword that drains his own chakra. The anime, however, extends this fight to make it a lot more engaging, especially with showing off how versatile Boruto is with his large range of movesets. It's one of Boruto's biggest strengths that makes him so different from other characters, so I'm glad the anime really does lean into this side of him a lot more than the manga does. Once the fight wraps up, Boruto passes on the lesson he had just learned to Owl, informing him that he can put his powers to good use. He's not a weapon to be controlled by others and can make his own decisions to serve his purpose with satisfaction. For this brief moment, Boruto's words resonate with him, as I guess this could be the first quote-unquote talk no jutsu moment from Boruto. Like father, like son. The threats don't end there however, as one of Kara's members, Kashin Koji, rolls up to the scene to clean up the mess Al was unable to handle, as he uses a piece of what made him human in his last moments to save Boruto, being the first and last time we see him use ninjutsu in this entire battle, resulting in him leaving this world as a shinobi and not at all. So, now we have a new character to deal with. When this chapter dropped, I remember pretty much the majority of people already guessing who this character covering his identity could be, especially because of his summoning technique and the Rasengan. There was a lot of panic because the community didn't really want this to be Jiraiya for good reason, but as we learn later, it's a bit different than most thought. A short skirmish between Koji and Konohamaru takes place, and when reading the manga, you may notice how obsessed Ikimoto is with using the same attack poses, more specifically this pose. On screen right now, I put up every single panel that shows this exact pose from chapter 23 all the way to chapter 80. I may have even missed some, but you get the point. There's nothing wrong with using the same action poses more than once, but when it's done in the exact same angle and the exact same leap in motion, it becomes way too obvious and boring to look at. Ikimoto has stated how he looks to the Dragon Ball manga when it comes to finding inspiration for his action sequences, as it's pretty apparent how Dragon Ball-esque some of these poses look. And again, getting inspiration isn't a bad thing, but in my opinion, I think it became a bit too overbearing at times, since I was able to notice how formulaic his battles would turn into as it would follow such a similar rhythm. But yeah, going back to the story, Konohamaru sucks. <laughs> he just sucks, <laughs> and he doesn't get any better from here, which is such a shame. But in exchange for how disappointing Konohamaru is, we get to see some of the potential Boruto's new power Karma possesses. The small preview we see from it is being able to absorb jutsus, which admittedly is a bit worrying at first due to how much the series leans into powers being absorbed, especially later on. But I'll touch on this later when it becomes more prevalent, since for right now, it isn't that much of an issue. Nevertheless, this isn't all the karma is used for, which we'll see soon enough. A small part of this chapter I really liked was Sarada wanting Boruto to lean on her after the battle due to his injuries, as this can be interpreted as a good symbolic reference for the type of character Boruto is with wanting to carry everything by himself so others don't get hurt, this especially being the case further down the road. And just like the Mujina bandits, this arc is fairly standard and short, slowly building up the big Illumin threat that was approaching. At this point in time, I was still looking for that next big arc where the series could show what it's made of, an arc that would create a permanent everlasting change to the story being told in a massive unforgettable way. Little did I know that that was quite literally a page turn away, introducing a character that had been teased since chapter 1 of the manga, the man who would forever change the direction of this story. This was the Kawaki arc. This arc immediately gets straight to the point by revealing the most fearsome villain in the series to date. Here we meet Jigen, as his introduction is very, well, very alien-like, which quite literally suits who he is. He engages in a conversation about his prized valuable vessel that's escaped while being in a complete state of ease. He's so unbothered that he just continues his meal like it was any other ordinary day. And why? Because as he says, it's just not possible for the vessel to escape him. One way or another, it will return. 
turn. He displays a great showing of control, even with a situation that seems unfavourable to him, all while still enjoying his food. His piercing black eyes are also incredibly telling of how easy it is for him to strike fear into anything that crosses his gaze, just like he did with Kawaki. Speaking of Kawaki, we get a short backstory of his father sending him off to Jigen. It's honestly the bare minimum, but once again the anime comes in to save the day by dedicating an entire episode to Kawaki's early life. It's a great addition that helps emphasise Kawaki's tragic upbringing he's been dealing with since birth, as well as some really great pieces of symbolic imagery with the goldfish Kawaki takes interest in. To even in his darkest moments, he hallucinates the fish flying around him as it becomes his source of comfort. The reason for this is because goldfish represent good luck and wealth, something Kawaki didn't have in this run downtown where he was forced to work from sunrise to sunset for his alcoholic no good father. Yet he clung on to this small piece of hope that came his way, even if it was just a fish. That was the only thing that lit up his dark world of constant abuse. What's even more twisted is how Jigen takes advantage of this connection Kawaki develops towards the goldfish to further break and traumatise him, making sure Kawaki fully understood that he had absolutely nothing. And Jigen wanted Kawaki to remain forever empty. Overall, this backstory is definitely worth the watch for any manga-only readers that may not have known about the anime extending this particular content. Heading back to present day, we get to see what Kawaki is truly made of with his first fight of the series. And no surprise here, but the anime is once again the superior version in this case. I absolutely love the art direction for this episode, as it attempts to match Ikimoto's style from the manga, which the anime hasn't really done up until this point. Such examples is Konohamaru's sudden change in hairstyle and the change in facial structure to make the characters look more mature. I'm happy this chapter got such a gorgeous looking adaption, as it definitely deserved this treatment to create such a memorable entrance for Kawaki. Considering all we know about him is what we saw in the short snippet of the time skip right at the very start of the series. It picks back up those seeds of excitement that were planted all those years ago, and continues to help that hype grow and take shape in this highly anticipated episode. It's basically the anime saying, this is what you are waiting for. The first section of this fight until Kawaki gets overpowered is only 7 pages long in the manga, all while the anime extends this by giving Kawaki a 5 minute long battle. In a way, it does remind me of the Kakashi vs Obito fight with how short it was in the manga until it was extended to perfection in the anime. Speaking of that fight, there's also a small reference to it where the characters perform the same actions. So yeah, as you can tell, I adored this fight as not only a great introduction to one of Boruto's most important characters, but to also the most game changing power we now know as Karma. The sheer level of intensity this arc has just introduced into the story has really set a promising stage of what's to come. After Kawaki's battle, he falls unconscious and gets taken back to the Hidden Leaf Village, where one of the most conflicting plot points for many people takes place. Naruto wants to personally handle Kawaki. This means literally having Kawaki live with him so he can monitor his entire life. Shikamaru even points out how ridiculous this sounds, but Naruto gives us a reminder of the journey we've seen him undertake. He fully understands what will happen if someone like Kawaki is left alone or thrown in a jail cell. The amount of enemies in the past that Naruto has encountered are living proof that Kawaki can go down the wrong path at any moment. Gara even agrees, someone who was directly saved by Naruto through love. This is the critical deciding moment that will dictate Kawaki's life choices, and Naruto plans to take advantage of this situation to avoid another Haku, another Gara, another Obito, and so on. For me, this makes perfect sense. But I do remember at the time there was a few questions being raised, not just over Kawaki, but why Naruto is able to give his full attention to a complete stranger and not his own child like we saw at the start of the series. Personally, this is a pretty weird thing to complain about. One, for the reason I just stated before. Two, because Naruto assumed even if he wasn't there with Boruto, at least he had a mother, sister, and friends that give him the attention he needs. But obviously Naruto underestimated the amount of support your own child required. Which brings me into my third and final point. Naruto has actually developed since all of this happened. He learned from his past mistake and understands he needs to be there, especially with this situation happening right now. Kawaki, however, isn't so hot about this idea, attempting to escape Naruto on numerous occasions. One such example actually being cut from the anime. This scene where Naruto is fed up with Kawaki's antics is exclusive to the manga, and honestly, this was a very smart decision for the anime to not include. I'll admit it, when I first saw this page, I was hyped. But when you think about it, this is actually really awful on Naruto's part. Didn't Naruto just 
say he's going to nurture Kawaki with love and that he sympathizes with the situation he's in. But now, here we have Naruto using his power to get Kawaki's attention to make him stay. Hmm, I wonder who else did something similar which caused Kawaki to always live in fear and be distrustful of others. Not really a good look having Naruto do something comparable to the main villain of the arc. So, yeah, great choice for the anime to completely cut out this segment. During the commotion, Kawaki breaks Himawari's vase by accident and decides to work on repairing it to build a better bond with Boruto. Naruto, however, takes him out to buy a new vase entirely to save him the hassle of rebuilding it. Yet Kawaki still isn't safe from his worst nightmares, as merely watching a plant be lowered into a vase is enough to remind him of his traumatic childhood. He sees himself as this vase, which in this case would be a vessel. Flowers emit life and only survive through care and attention. Yet Kawaki can't see things that way. All he sees is death. That's when Naruto takes this opportunity to mentally heal Kawaki, displaying how the strongest bond of love can help heal those wounds over time, as Kawaki's anguish fades away. We then get a scene of Sarada saying to Kawaki that he can lean on her shoulder whenever needed, following in the footsteps of Naruto's caring attitude since she wants to become Hokage. It's a good character moment even if it is pretty small, but it is a bit worrying how her dream to become Hokage is kind of forgettable at this point, considering she's in the background all of the time, just like Mitsuki, just simply following Boruto's story and reacting to the events that surround him. Wish there was more to her taking the initiative, just like in this scene, because it does work towards the type of character she strives to be. The story then shifts to Koji entering the village after giving a monologue about how anything foreign can't enter without being detected, as only those who are associated with the village are able to enter. At this point, it's become pretty clear who this person is due to his connection with Konoha that I'm sure most of the community was able to figure out at this point. It almost feels like the disguise Koji wears isn't to create suspicion for the reader due to how painfully obvious it is, but just so other characters in the story don't figure it out. This is a much different scenario compared to Obito, as while I did figure out who he was very early on in the series, there was most definitely a lot of red herrings that Kishimoto planted to trick the reader and it actually worked. Of course, it won't work for everyone, but either way, he still successfully made readers question things even more. Meanwhile for Koji, we don't really have that. We just see him taking part in activities we know Jiraiya can do. It makes his mysterious atmosphere lose interest points for me personally. But what's always most important is how this reveal ends up being delivered. Even though I knew who Toby was, what mattered was the impact and timing of the reveal. After all, I've read Naruto many times, so when it came to re-watching slash re-reading the actions of Toby with full confirmation he was Obito, I was able to look at his actions through a different angle that only made his character more interesting and appealing. I mean, just imagine if I said, now that I've read all of Naruto and know every single plot point, it's no longer engaging. What matters is the delivery and purpose for why things are set up this way. Heading back to the gang, we get to see more nice father-son bonding taking place. It's a small thing, but makes the character arcs these two went through feel all the more real as it keeps their interactions consistent. The scene of Boruto and Naruto bonding is also acknowledged by Kawaki, yet it only reminds him of how different his training went with his own father figure. Kawaki was raised to believe he had nothing and will forever have nothing. No family, no friends, no talent. The only bond he has is linked to suffering, through the power of karma. But meanwhile for Naruto, he introduces Kawaki to the power of chakra, explaining how its primary focus isn't for power, but for connecting people. Naruto presents to him a power that doesn't need to be used to hurt others, but instead one that can be used to heal hearts from loneliness. It's a similar learning experience Boruto went through when it came to ninja tools, discovering how they aren't solely used for destruction, but to help others. After this, Kawaki attempts to rebuild the vase for real this time, being a symbolic interpretation of him attempting to rebuild himself after being broken by Jigen. Yet obviously, it's not that easy. He believes it just isn't possible to rebuild something so broken. However, this is where the downtime stops, as the story heads into its next big fight with Naruto vs Delta. Unfortunately, this battle is where I started to notice a few problems, one of them being the realisation of just how much Ikimoto abuses speed lines that replace the entire surrounding environment. It's fine to have these in general, but when it's page after page of just non-stop speed lines, it makes the fighting that's taking place feel a lot more, quite literally, detached from what's going on. 
It's like they've just been teleported to a different area. Showing the environment will help this fight not feel so isolated. Of course, there are parts of this battle that does, but the point I'm saying here is that this speed line effect goes on for way too long back to back for my liking. It especially doesn't work in scenes like this, where Naruto is clearly using the ground to regain his footing, but the environment isn't included. It makes it look a bit awkward because we just have the rocks and these skidding cloud effects appearing in this void of speed lines. All we really need is a piece of the environment to help better display this action sequence, as it would be a really nice transition back to the main event because Naruto is slowing himself down. In fact, the very next panel does exactly what I'm talking about and it's perfect. Naruto has the environment around him while Delta is still surrounded by the speed lines, as you can really feel the impact and importance of this counter grab from Naruto to not get launched by the attack coming his way. But now moving on to another problem this fight has, it's making the trend of villains being able to absorb ninjutsu more obvious and repetitive. In one way, it's great because it keeps characters such as Naruto and Sasuke in check to not go overboard with their large array of powers. It forces the battles to be smaller and close quarters, meaning we get to see more hand-to-hand -hand combat which I'll never get tired of. However, it really sucks having ninjutsu, one of the core elements of what makes a ninja, be written off like this. In a way, it makes sense since technology is slowly replacing the need for shinobi to learn such tricks, but just like the speed line problem, it becomes too much and not really all that creative and special once we have another enemy have the same ability as part of the arsenal. There needs to be a good balance, and I don't think this is it, because it also ends up limiting what the lower level characters can do, such as the main character himself. As Boruto isn't able to show off his large array of jutsus in creative ways majority of the time because everyone and their mother can absorb his techniques. Now, I've been quite negative, but let me share something that I actually like about this fight. Speed lines aside, I do really love how much space Ikimoto gives for these battles. It's not over cluttered with panels attempting to squeeze in everything, but instead they're given the room to breathe with these big panels that help convey the weight of these actions taking place. There's some big moves being pulled off here, and so having these large panels helps emphasize exactly that by showing just how big and heavy these attacks are. It feels very cinematic, especially when there's barely any dialogue taking up the page. This conflict also has a great moment of Kawaki jumping in the way to save Himawari and Naruto. Though with how Kawaki develops later on, it's an interesting thought to know if Kawaki would have still taken the hit if Naruto wasn't there. As he said, if the Hokage goes down, that's it. It's an interesting yet clever way to foreshadow and disguise the path Kawaki will eventually head towards. The battle ends in a satisfying way with Naruto using the chakra advantage he's always had from the Ninetales, continuing to stream out an endless wave of chakra to make Delta overheat with her absorption ability. It plays out in a way that makes sense for both characters, as this is something only Naruto could pull off due to his large amount of chakra supply. He's quite literally built different. Due to Kawaki leaping in to save Naruto and Himawari, his hand is sacrificed in the process, receiving a prosthetic instead that runs off Naruto's chakra, further proving to Kawaki how chakra is a bond keeping people connected, solidifying his relationship with Naruto even more. We then get the reveal that Momoshiki isn't exactly out of the picture just yet, as Boruto's karma locks him into the same fate as Kawaki, becoming a vessel for an Otsutsuki. There's also a small scene of Kawaki's interest for Naruto growing when he obtains a trading card of Naruto. And when reading this page, what I really liked was how the panel right next to Kawaki is Sarada. She wants to become Hokage and respects the position Naruto has, but it doesn't ever lead into an unhealthy obsession like Kawaki's. And so this really made me think about how much of a missed opportunity there was of the possibility of Sarada challenging Kawaki's way of thinking. The love for the Hokage is different, so a clash of the ideals would be perfectly placed and would result in some great growth for Sarada especially since she desperately needs it. But hey, maybe this could happen in part 2 of the series, who knows. All I know is that it's an incredibly wasted conflict that's literally being laid out right before the reader's eyes if it never comes to fruition. A small conversation between Kawaki and Kuruma takes place, as Kuruma single-handedly puts to rest all of those awful takes that Naruto was only strong because of the Ninetales power, admitting he himself was the one getting in the way of Naruto's development on purpose. Kuruma also points out more connections between Naruto and Kawaki, such as both essentially being vessels. Naruto, however, chose to not let himself be filled with despair, but instead the bonds that helped him grow stronger. This is the type of person Kawaki aspires to be, but for Kawaki, there was always a piece of him that refused to heal, and so the 
the best option for him was to cover that wound with love. Unfortunately, this would eventually develop in a much more twisted way due to this irregular piece being the reason why Kawaki is able to keep himself together. Meanwhile with Sasuke, he makes the discovery that the Otsutsuki not only come in pairs, but that also another 10 tails has been kept as the little pet. It's a small hint at the Otsutsuki lore being expanded upon, which is something that's really welcome considering it has been lacking in that area a bit, even with them being the main villains for the series. This is when Jigen makes his move as Ikimoto does a great job at making his first public appearance as unsettling as can be. Not only because of how easy he makes teleporting into the heart of the leaf village look, into Naruto's house no less, but also due to how Ikimoto illustrates his appearance. His portrayal is otherworldly and fierce, which does a great job at drawing the line between him and the rest of the characters. Yet he still entertains us with his dialogue by deliberately bringing himself down to the level of humans. Like when he says it was rude of him to not take off his shoes when entering the house. It's as if he mocks the parts of us that makes humans so simple minded. Acting like in this situation, that's something Naruto would be worrying about the most. It shows his level of confidence and that he's in control. As his chilling unknown side mixes well with his confident dialogue, creating an intimidating atmosphere. Next begins one of the biggest fights to take place in a series with Naruto and Sasuke versus Jigen. Battling it out in another dimension where they have the chance to go all out and take down this threat once and for all. Again, the anime steals the show for this segment, even though the manga is still fairly good with how it's choreographed. But again, the overabundance of back to back speed lines just really doesn't do it for me. And I feel like this was the moment where I understood why Ikimoto relies so heavily on this technique. When it comes to the actions these characters do, we pretty much never see smear lines or a large amount of speed lines on the characters' bodies. They're used very minimal for some reason, and so it results in these attacks not feeling as fast or powerful as they could be. So to make up for that lack of energy, Ikimoto instead swaps out the environment with speed lines to help better convey these attacks. While I do understand this reasoning, I can't say I'm a fan of it as it ends up doing more damage than good when it comes to immersing us into the fight. Heading back to the anime, I think this fight does a great job at showing the difference between Jigen and Naruto and Sasuke. They get absolutely overwhelmed, but sometimes manage to pull off a move or two that turns the tables for one split second before being put back in their place again. I also really love the scene where Jigen acknowledges this and replies, you'll never be as lucky as you just were. His character does such a magnificent job at intimidation, like all hope is lost and the heroes are just fighting a futile battle. There's also a few callbacks to the Momoshiki fight, as while they were in control of the battle back then, a completely different story is written across their faces now. Some moments in the fight even feel like homages to battles that took place in the original Naruto series, such as Madara vs the Shinobi Alliance, as well as Naruto vs Pain. There's a lot of really cool details to pick up on, my favourite being Naruto patting Sasuke on the shoulder before they charge in. A nice piece of characterization to show their brotherly bond, which makes the whole 700 chapter journey we've seen these two developing alongside one another feel all the more real. As the battle draws to a close, unsurprisingly, Jigen is the victor, ending with Naruto being sealed. I remember people believing this was the moment foreshadowed at the start of the time skip, where Kawaki says he'll send Boruto to the same place he sent Naruto. Obviously, this wasn't the case, but in a way, a clever bait to create discussions. Before Naruto gets sealed, we get some final words from him, promising to feed back Jigen's own words, a statement that most definitely does get fulfilled later down the road. Now that Naruto and Sasuke were out of the picture, it was about time for the next generation to step up. Unfortunately, we're not off to a good start. This chapter made me realise just how much of a boring character Mitsuki has become. He's literally just there to explain and react like things are getting big or we're stuck inside a barrier. He's boring and continues spouting a waste of dialogue, which is really unfortunate considering he was the most mysterious and intriguing character out of the original team. But his dialogue is anything but that with these plain useless responses. Moving on, thanks to the quite literal bond of chakra Naruto shared with Kawaki through his arm, this presents an opportunity for Kawaki to return the favour and save Naruto. And with this, we finally get a Team 7 fight with no adults whatsoever to take part. I don't know when the last time, if ever, this was a thing. Maybe the fight with Ao, but that was mostly Boruto taking charge. While for this battle, it's quite clearly a team effort, even with there being another star player on the field. This time, it was Sarada's turn. Before talking about the fight, I do want to mention some anime-only content surrounding the enemy named Boro. Before all of this, there were a 
a few episodes surrounding his character and the cult he built for those that wish to have remained in the infinite Tsukiyomi Madara casted back in the 4th Great Ninja War. This idea is really interesting because it makes sense that there would be people who wish to stay in the perfect dream world rather than come back to reality. He also attempts to rise to the saviour title even more by secretly poisoning villages, resulting in the people begging for a cure that only he possessed. Sounds interesting, right? Unfortunately, when watching it unfold, it just isn't all that captivating even with all of the pieces there. And it doesn't make the weight of the fight between Boro and Team 7 any better either. It's really just some more character building for Boro to not make him feel as one dimensional but it just doesn't do the job all that well since his ideals that are explored in the anime original content doesn't get mentioned in this fight. Almost like there was no point in doing such a story on him in the first place even if the concept itself was interesting. But besides that, the fight itself is pretty good. The physical attacks are not only interesting but also the tactical atmosphere this battle sets. These four know they're at a disadvantage immediately and so that's where the core basics of what makes a shinobi come into play. A strategy and teamwork is the element that can flip the odds in their favour and there's some clever examples sprinkled in here. Like Mitsuki using his snakes to take in the mist virus Boro has been using so Sarada can see firsthand what it's made of. To then Mitsuki hatching an idea on how to create an antidote. This is the most consistent amount of times I've been pleased with Mitsuki's contribution and the praise is deserved. It makes sense for him to be a valuable player in a fight that gets dominated in the first half by a virus, considering he is the son of the experimental Orochimaru. And another reason why this battle is great in general is because we don't have to worry about Jutsu's being absorbed either, which leads to some great calculated plays, especially from Sarada. This is her chance to act like a leader for once, which is a great step forward to becoming Hokage. Her decisions and sharp eyes is what leads their match to victory, and even though she needs reaffirming from others that she can do it due to her having doubts, I really like this character moment from Sarada as it leads into her growing more confident for the role of a leader who doesn't hesitate. While Sarada has always taught tough, this situation demonstrates how when you actually have to prove yourself through actions that it becomes an entirely different story. It's a very human and relatable aspect when it comes to her growth of maturing that I really appreciated. The climax of her growth in this fight is seen from her using the Chidori, the manga showing absolutely no training or hints towards which makes it come out of nowhere. And speaking out of nowhere, Sarada now has a free Tomoe? It's all quite a lot. Thankfully, the anime takes care of this problem which makes for a much better transition and payoff to these moments. We actually see Sarada training with Sasuke to master the Chidori, and then in the deeper fight, we get to see her Sharingan evolve to the second Tomoe which the anime keeps in the Boro fight, as we've yet to still see her evolve to a third Tomoe in the anime. Again, this anime only arc is definitely worth the watch to see the fruits of the team's training, especially Sarada's, I feel more rewarding to watch unfold. Speaking of surprises, this is also the first time we see Momoshiki possess Boruto's body. The anime absolutely nails his almighty presence too, with how cinematic they make his first reappearance be. This sighting then sparks the question if Momoshiki is gonna be the Kuruma for Boruto's story. Part 2 is still left to be decided on how the story goes forward, but for me personally, I don't really want there to be a friendship pact between the two. I think Momoshiki works best when he's snarky and greedy while constantly preying on the downfall of Boruto. It makes for some fun interactions, especially towards the end of part 1. Skipping ahead a bit, this arc begins its sprint to the climax as Kashin Koji takes on Jigen. As thanks to Amado betraying Kara and seeking protection from Konoha, everyone gets their front row seats to watch this decisive battle play out. This of course includes Naruto. Noticing the way Koji in fights seems familiar, and I'm glad this is something he catches sight of right away when the fight has barely even started. It shows his connection to Jiraiya, and it continues to prove how he was always the closest person to understanding him. We then actually learn more about Kaguya in this fight with how both her and Ishiki came to this planet together, but in a sudden change of heart, Kaguya betrayed Ishiki. This builds up more upon the information given in the original Naruto manga about how Kaguya was building an army to help defend against a threat that was coming her way. Overall, I do like this added lore to the Otsutsuki, but I still feel like there could be more detailed explanations since I have seen some people be confused about it all. This battle is all about revelations now that I mention it, as we learn about Jigen actually being a vessel for Ishiki Otsutsuki, being the Otsutsuki that was paired with Kaguya as I just mentioned. The whole build up to Ishiki's true form is great, as it's like a horror 
movie where the monster is about to be revealed, all while we learn about its deadly intentions through Amado's info dumping as it helps set this ominous atmosphere, perfect for an otherworldly final villain. Though I can't say I'm a fan of the design or name change compared to Jigen however. An explanation to Karma is also given as the discovery of Boruto essentially being a ticking time bomb is made, counting down the days till Momoshiki overwrites his body, till Boruto's existence is no more. This is a really great extra layer to add to Boruto's dilemma, because it makes Boruto's situation separate itself from the predicament Naruto was in with Kurama. When Naruto lost control of his feelings, the seal that kept Kurama caged would weaken, as the chance for Kurama to take over his body for good would grow more as time went on. But for Boruto, it didn't matter what emotional state he was in. Every second that goes by is ticking down to his demise with absolutely no way of stopping it apart from himself. And what I also love about this inclusion is that Boruto gets a lot of slack from the community about how he doesn't suffer enough, which I always thought was really weird considering Boruto does go through his own fair bit of suffering, but this extra weight is a lot more heavy that people simply can't ignore it. So hey, the wish was answered either way. A really great piece of dialogue we see is when Naruto is concerned about Koji not making it back alive from his battle against Ishiki, as Amado admits that indeed is the case. This was to be his graveyard, and for Naruto, that angers him. Sending someone on a one-way mission that will most surely result in them never returning is something he could not possibly ever agree to. Amado's response is where the hidden meaning of this interaction should click for you all. He replies, what's your point, and why are you so bothered? Naruto has experienced this exact situation with someone from his past, an individual who knew they may never return home in order to fulfill the mission they wish to accomplish, a decision he's already shown to not agree with and display clear frustration over. This is, of course, Jiraiya's final mission to the Hidden Rain, being a similar set of circumstances that were seen play out right now before Naruto's eyes, and it's incredibly substantial to Naruto's character that he feels that itch of annoyance, even though he can't put his finger on why it's bothering him so much. This then all accumulates into the final revelation, as everyone is gathered to witness the reveal of Kashin Koji, not being Jiraiya himself, but rather a clone of Jiraiya instead. When I read this for the first time, I let out the biggest sigh of relief ever. A clone I could deal with, the real thing however would be a no-go, especially since Kishimoto himself has said in interviews he did not want to bring Jiraiya back to life at all during his publication with the original Naruto series, so I'm thankful this decision was still kept true to this day. The reason for it being Jiraiya of all people is actually interesting too, because as Ishiki explains, Jiraiya was a shinobi that was responsible for bringing change to the world, finding the child of prophecy, a discovery that would result in a great change to the shinobi world, and because of that, Amado clinged to this hope. He clung to the possibility that lightning would strike twice, producing a clone of Jiraiya to spark another change. Just like how Jiraiya's purpose was to find the chosen one, Kashin Koji's purpose was to destroy Ishiki. It really does show desperation to cling to the past to deal with the future, because even with the knowledge of this being a clone of Jiraiya that gives an extra ray of hope to the situation, the outcome wasn't guaranteed. This was laughable to Ishiki. Just like Jiraiya, Ishiki planned for Koji to die on his most important mission. The way Koji gets defeated is also a callback to Jiraiya being stabbed by the six paths of pain, but instead of rods, it's by columns. Speaking of callbacks, once Ishiki was done with this battle, he immediately teleports over to Konoha village in order to find Kawaki, as Ishiki floating over the village emits strong pain vibes when he came in search for Naruto. The discussion Boruto and Sasuke have before the battle with Ishiki is a really great way to set the atmosphere of the fight, and actually foreshadows future events about putting your life on the line for the village. It's not only about the fear of death, but for Boruto, it's losing control and hurting others. And Sasuke's response to this is pretty heavy, saying he's prepared to kill Boruto himself if it ever gets to that point. Because not only does he know Naruto wouldn't commit to such an action, but as Boruto's teacher, the responsibility lies with him. While this sounds incredibly harsh and drastic, in reality, it shows a lot of respect Sasuke has for Boruto. He's treating him like a proper shinobi because that's what Boruto wants to be acknowledged as. Not some useless burden, but a ninja who's willing to put his life on the line to protect those around him. It's a great rising up to the occasion moment, and if you still considered Boruto a brat up to now, this is the moment of growth where he officially leaves such a childish name tag behind, carrying now an even greater title with
with him. The ultimate climax then kicks off with Naruto, Sasuke, and Boruto versus Ishiki, where they have to stall for time until Ishiki's life runs out. However, these guys have to stall him for a few days, which already made the impossible battle even more impossible. Like most climactic fights, the anime surpasses this content in the manga by leaps and bounds. There's some really great extra content here, but I especially feel sorry for Sasuke with how much he gets beaten to a pole. Ishiki absolutely hates Sasuke's Rinnegan, and these scenes definitely help convey that spiteful energy. But when we get to Naruto's section of the battle, we get to witness a new ability from him that wasn't shown in the manga, as Naruto uses Kuruma's chakra in a similar way to Hinata's twin line fist. Can't help but think Hinata possibly taught this to him, which is kinda sweet. Nevertheless, it's still not enough for Naruto to control the fight. The anime helping convey Ishiki's dominant authority through some super menacing shots. Saying lines like how he'll take them out one at a time in the most calm collected tone ever feels like this is just another day in the office for him. His creepiness is definitely enhanced thanks to his Japanese voice actor Kenjiro Suda. They couldn't have picked a better voice for his character. One of the most interesting changes the anime made however is with Boruto and Sasuke. The first one is small but it's a nice callback, showing Sasuke protecting Boruto from Ishiki's attack as they're positioned in a similar way to how Sasuke protects Naruto from Haku's attack in the Land of Waves. But the big change that I absolutely love is this. In the manga, Boruto jumps in to protect Sasuke from Ishiki who was about to stab him. It's a quick moment yet it's great at showing Boruto's resolve with jumping in harm's way to protect others. However, the anime elevates this to make it an even more top tier character moment. Instead, Ishiki uses one of his cubes to crush Sasuke, but Boruto rushes into action immediately and uses his Rasengan to prevent it from moving. But this isn't any normal Rasengan. This is the Rasengan Boruto trained to master in the Kara Actuation arc. Again, this is just one of the many reasons why this anime only arc is a must watch, as I thought it was a really nice touch to bring this technique into manga canon content. More of Boruto's growth is shown immediately as he catches on that Ishiki can't kill him due to being a valuable vessel to feed to the Tentails. Boruto threatens to end his life in order to foil Ishiki's plans. And this isn't a bluff as you can actually see Boruto about to off himself before Ishiki shrinks his kunai. This battle so far has done a really great job at showcasing Boruto's growth even though he's not physically strong enough to partake in the fight. But thanks to his strong conviction, his presence in the battle is made loud and clear. Although I do like how this doesn't phase Ishiki at all, informing Boruto how he has no issue with breaking him as the anime does a really superb job at displaying the traumatic torture Ishiki puts him through by breaking his arm. As all hope seems lost, one of the biggest and actually most divisive moments in the series makes its grand entry. Enter Baryon Mode. This is a transformation that caught a lot of people off guard, myself included. It really does come out of nowhere with no signs of foreshadowing whatsoever, since it's something Kurama says he's always had as a backup plan, but only when Naruto was on his last stand ready to accept an early death. And when I say it's something Kurama always had, I don't mean it as a power he's kept reserved since the original Naruto series, but a power that was discovered in this generation. He starts talking about... Uh, nuclear fusion, which is a bit strange of him to be suddenly showing off his secret degree in science. But if we are going along with it, then it's more acceptable to assume he learned this thanks to how advanced Konoha has become over the years, making more sense about him digging deep into something so sophisticated. This is definitely not something he would have known back in the original Naruto series. This mode is just really convenient in general since it has the exact counter Naruto needs to win the fight, as every hit he lands on Ishiki shortens his lifespan. What should have been 20 hours of life left quickly turns into 10 minutes remaining towards the end of the fight. But with all of the questionable things out of the way, what about the battle itself? The anime once again takes the cake in this area thanks to how well choreographed it is. This really is Naruto's version of Ultra Instinct where he's got to get rid of all thoughts and focus purely on the fight, as he's never looked better with his taijutsu skills. There's some really neat homages here, such as Naruto performing the same combo he delivered to Sasuke back at the first fight in the final valley, as well as Naruto's tails resembling the Will of Fire statue in Konoha, not only symbolizing the strength to continue fighting against all odds to protect the next generation, but also death. 
On a side note, ending 17 of Boruto is perfect in showing the cycle of life and death, both through visuals and song, so make sure to check it out if you haven't already. Naruto eventually reaches his limit, as Ishiki manages to drag Kawaki to their location thanks to the quite literal bond Kawaki and Naruto share through Naruto's chakra. I really like this line from Ishiki where he says the bond they shared turned out to be a negative factor in the end because it led to their demise, even though Kawaki had previously preached about it being something that saved him. I kinda wish more of Ishiki's character poked holes into this concept of bonds to test Naruto and Kawaki's resolve. He kind of does that at the start by always saying Kawaki is forever empty and alone, but it would have been nice to perhaps dive deeper into this, especially for Ishiki's character, to add that extra layer of depth to him for a more deep-rooted, emotionally complex villain. When Kawaki tries to make his escape, the anime does a magnificent job at capturing the desperation for this 5-minute game of hide-and-seek where everything is crashing down. The panic attack the anime depicts for Kawaki is without a doubt my favourite part, his life quite literally flashing before his eyes not just for him, but for the bond he shared with Naruto too, as Naruto has essentially become his life. Without him, it's over. The anime successfully depicts how just a mere countdown has such power over Kawaki, automatically confining him to a fate he was all too familiar with. For Kawaki, it was something he had to face head on. It turns out however with relative ease that Kawaki outplays Ishiki with a shadow clone, and it's pretty neat seeing him use Naruto's signature technique as a final rebellious move against his abusive father. With that, Ishiki's hopes and dreams quite literally come crumbling down. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about him being outplayed by a single clone of all things, but it feels a lot less quote unquote cheap since it's a great payoff moment for Kawaki. This simply wouldn't work with anyone else. But as I've been seeing a few times throughout this video, I can't help but wish we got more from Ishiki. As to this day, I'm still not completely satisfied with his character due to him being fairly straightforward. But just when we think everything has settled down, another conflict rises. Man, the online reception on the day this chapter dropped was insane, and like most talked about Boruto chapters, quite the mixed bag. This is quite clearly a way to nerf Sasuke, and soon we'll be seeing a nerf heading to Naruto too. This was the arc where the writer decided things had to change, where Naruto and Sasuke would no longer be as reliable as they once were. And by reliable, I mean that they no longer feel like the cleanup crew. For this moment in particular, I'm in the minority, but I think it makes sense for how it happened. For one, Sasuke just had the most intense beating he's ever received, as he's quite clearly still fatigued. And two, I don't think Sasuke expected Boruto of all people to leap forward to attack him like that. This is his first time encountering Momoshiki taking over Boruto's body after all. I think it's more poetic that Momoshiki is the one to deal with Sasuke's eye too, considering how much he absolutely hated it during their battle long ago. I also like how there's no speed lines in this panel which I'm very surprised Ikimoto didn't include. Makes the moment a lot more dramatic where you're completely focused on this single action. He made the choice to not draw any of the surrounding environment after all, so it was definitely a stylized artistic decision. Now, I think it's time we talk about arguably the biggest moment in this entire arc. I'm of course talking about the final farewell between Naruto and Kuruma. For starters, let's talk about the manga version of their closing words. And I'm going to be honest, but the manga has some downright horrendous dialogue for this discussion which is honestly quite insulting to both these characters. For example, Kuruma says this will be the final conversation, so it's time to get talking. And Naruto responds with, well, you killed my mum and dad, oh no wait, that's not right, we've been through a lot together, thanks for sticking with me. What? What kind of conversation is this? Even Kuruma is confused at what's coming out of Naruto his mouth, asking if that's really the last thing he wanted to say. Now let me go in more detail about why this dialogue just does not work at all. I've seen people defend this by saying, oh it's just Naruto stumbling on his words and being awkward with the delivery, or it's just meant to be a joke between them both. This honestly doesn't cut it, because it still leaves a bad and rather awkward taste in your mouth for arguably the most emotional final farewell scene in the entire series, because at this very moment we believe both of them are dying 
combine together. Also, Naruto would never speak like this, especially to someone like Kurama who has stuck alongside Naruto since birth. Naruto isn't the type of person to bring up someone's past to their face, that's what makes Naruto, Naruto. Thankfully, the anime gets rid of this horrible dialogue while also adding in extra scenes that you can't help but just smile at, as it perfectly displays the bonds Naruto and Kurama share. It's a lot more heart-wrenching seeing the realisation in Naruto's face when he learns Kurama is the only one that'll be dying, and the anime adding in a montage of all their moments together is just the icing on the cake. This is how you deliver a final farewell that I just didn't get from the manga at all. And I won't lie, I definitely shed a few tears watching this episode for the first time. Maybe it's due to me having grown up with Naruto, which makes the connection to Kurama feel all the more real, just like it did for Naruto, because he was always there. It's a magnificent way to end Kurama's character journey from a demon of hatred that wanted nothing but destruction to becoming the saviour of the world he used to condemn. Really beautiful stuff. This is easily the best Boruto arc so far. It most surely had its low points, but this truly felt like a story arc that directed the series down a much more engaging route, where things actually feel like they're moving. And a lot of it is thanks to Kawaki. Ever since he showed up, this story has been getting better and better. And I'm glad that's the case considering how much of a big expectation I had for his character after seeing him for the first time in that time skip preview. However, just when I felt like the Boruto story was taking massive leaps in quality, something rather peculiar happened towards the end of this arc. Chapter 51 of Boruto would be the final chapter where the writer Ukiyo Kodachi would be credited, as Kishimoto would proceed to take over his position as writer. Kodachi would announce this through a message, as well as the official Naruto Twitter account, who would go on to say this was always planned right from the beginning. Now, obviously, no one is going to know the real reason behind this change. In fact, this could could be the truth. But for me, I don't buy it. This eventual change in writer was never announced at the start of Boruto's publication, but now, just like Aizen, it's suddenly been revealed that it's been planned from the very start. It's also such an incredibly awkward time to change writer, because following right after the final chapter Kodachi works on is when Baryon Mode makes its first appearance. It's just so, so strange to switch writers in the climax to the biggest arc so far right in the middle of the final fight. Like, couldn't they have waited for the arc to wrap up first? There were only four chapters left after all. Perhaps the final section of this arc had already been written in advance? But another problem I have with this is that I just can't see Kishimoto ever agreeing to such a deal. When Naruto ended, a few years later, Kishimoto would move on to make another manga called Samurai 8, which would also end up being published while the Boruto manga was still ongoing at this time. Samurai 8 would eventually get cancelled, yet if we think about it from Kishimoto's perspective, who thought he would work on Samurai 8 for much longer, I just don't think he would have wanted to work on both Samurai 8 and Boruto at the same time. Being just a supervisor to Boruto is a lot more of a comfortable role for him due to not taking on more of the heavier responsibilities. And honestly, ever since the Naruto manga wrapped up, it's always felt like Kishimoto has always wanted to distance himself from the franchise and not be so heavily involved with it anymore. Of course, he's still always there, and I'm sure he loves this series he's raised, but I do think he was at the point where he wanted to try other things, which led to Samurai 8. If Kishimoto really wanted to write Boruto, then he would have done it from the very start. It just doesn't sound right to make someone build up over 50 chapters worth of story to then take over and quote unquote steal the show. Kodachi has also been very vocal on Twitter about complaining to Shueisha about a lack of editors, which could have led to some heated exchanges behind the scenes when it came to the higher up. But of course, something like this is a situation Jump would never announce, which is why these rumours remain as rumours. It's important for me to say that the conclusions I've reached with these theories are all my opinion. I've based my answers on the information that's out there, but I'm not willing to die on this hill. It's just purely speculation and rumours. <sighs> that was a lot, but either way, the show must go on. With Kishimoto now at the helm with the writing, the fandom was interested to know if the quality would jump or dive. After all, switching writers this far deep is a worrying predicament for the future of the story. So, with that being said, the Boruto story would move on to introduce us to a new threat. It was that last time for Code's Assault.
With the main threat out of the picture, it was time to focus on someone new. Enter Code. Arguably the villain that gets the most time dedicated to his build up from this point onwards, but in a much different way when compared to someone like Ishiki. While Ishiki started off fierce and powerful from start to finish, the same cannot be said for Code. Our first real introduction paints him as a failure due to having a karma that failed at making him become a vessel. Yet even so, he still has to carry on the Yotsutsuki legacy and finish what Ishiki started. Started. Code has some large shoes to fill, which he'll find out sooner than later. I even really appreciate the small characterization done for Code to show how different he truly is. When he's trekking through the snow, you'd normally expect the villain to keep their serious demeanor no matter the temperature. But only a few pages later, we see him clearly cold and shivering. It displays how he's not exactly built like the rest, as Amado quite literally says that Code is special. While he's carrying the legacy of the Yotsutsuki on his back, he's still only human at the end of the day. And just like any other human, mistakes and failures are part of the journey to growing stronger. Next we get introduced to the most broken set of characters to ever set foot in the series. First up is Ada, a girl who anyone sets their sights on will automatically fall head over heels in love with her. But not only that, she can pretty much see everything that's going on in the world right now. Think of it like CCTV cameras being placed everywhere, having the complete freedom to view every single one of those cameras at any time. Time. These abilities are, understandably, a lot. But what's interesting is that Ada shares this sentiment, especially with her first power. She hates it, a position where it's hard to tell if someone's been true with their emotions. The Yotsutsuki, however, are an exception to this rule of forced love, and so she longs to see if she can at last experience true love through this small opening. Following this, we then get introduced to the younger brother of Ada, Damon, possessing the ability to reflect attacks at its opponents without even lifting a finger. This doesn't just include physical attacks, but merely having killing intent is enough to reflect the end result right back at the user. So yeah, a very drastic leap in powers to what we're used to. So let's see what's in store for them. Heading back to the village, a 5 car game meeting commences, discussing the situation with the looming threat of code as we get a small dialogue exchange between Gara and Naruto that sets the stage for future events. Gara raises the question if Naruto would be able to to take down his own son, and Naruto, while hesitating slightly to respond immediately, replies that he'll do what needs to be done as Hokage. This in a way is a similar mindset that Kawaki begins to share, doing what needs to be done to protect the Hokage, yet with a much more ruthless tone than Naruto's. It ends up creating a really interesting crossroads later for both Naruto and Kawaki, when Kawaki is the one to take the initiative by killing Boruto while Naruto couldn't. Of course, I'll discuss this a bit more later once we arrive at that point, but it wraps back round to Naruto's ideals of what must be done as the Hokage. I also really like how Gara was the one to ask this hard-hitting question to Naruto, considering Gara understands what it's like to have a father that tries to kill his own son. It makes the already personal question a lot more personal than it already was coming from him rather than anyone else. Meanwhile, a training exercise is underway with Boruto's squad as we see Kawaki's cold attitude continue to grow, admitting that he's like Jigen in ways that aren't the best, but it shows results either way. Such examples being tough physical training as he's attempting to do now, as well as displaying a more cold approach that takes centre stage later on which shows a lot of similarities to Jigen's personality. A slight nitpick I have with this training section is that I really don't like how Sarada needs Boruto to jump in the way to protect her. She's more than competent at taking care of herself considering she has the Sharingan, yet for some reason didn't bother using it. Especially against Kawaki of all people who only just started training in the shinobi arts recently. Sarada should be 100% capable of identifying his tricks with shadow clones of all things. It's just annoying because I know she can do better. Kawaki's frustration to speed up the training is understandable however, as he out of everyone else feels the weakest. While he hated karma, it was undeniable how much of a significant power boost it was. But the main reason he hated karma to begin with was because of Ishiki. And with him out of the picture, let's Kawaki recontextualize things in his own way. As Amado says, this is his chance to make it his own power. Not Kara's, not Ishiki's, just his and his alone. Yet even so, later on Kawaki dishes out his feelings of struggling to find a place to belong, showing how much of a tight hold Ishiki continues to have on him long after death. He's still brainwashed into believing he doesn't have a purpose now that Ishiki is gone, as his sole reason for who he is today was for Ishiki's benefit. But 
but now Naruto is the one to step into Kawaki's life and create a new path for him. When one door closes, another opens. Naruto calling Kawaki his son is also just super wholesome, helping reassure Kawaki that he does have a home here. I also like the scene of Boruto giving Kawaki his headband, lending it to him in similar fashion to how Sasuke lent his headband to Boruto, trying to follow in Sasuke's footsteps. It's small characterization moments like this that aren't groundbreaking for the story, but in turn, they help show the gradual evolution of these characters and how real their ideals feel. This chapter with the Uzumaki family interacting with one another is just a whole lot of fun in general. It's a much needed calm before the storm. This is also the chapter where Naruto explains why he was so accepting of Kawaki to begin with. I did touch upon his reasoning earlier in the previous arc, but Naruto says it best himself. If someone like Kawaki can't live at ease, then there was simply no point in him becoming Hokage. It's a great powerful statement to show how Naruto is making sure his home is everyone's home, no matter the history they carry. This quote has also been twisted online quite a bit, as people interpreted Naruto admitting being Hokage was a mistake. This is clearly just taking the panel out of context, and proves these types of people are not following the story and do not understand Naruto's character in the slightest. It's dumb, but I wanted to mention it since I do remember that unfortunately being the headliner everyone talked about when this chapter dropped. Skipping ahead a bit, Kawaki sneaks out of Konoha undetected to try to settle things with Code himself in hope that Naruto won't be a future casualty. It's amusing to see just how useless the other shinobi are considering all they had to do was monitor Kawaki. Like I know they can't do anything, but it's always laughable how pathetic they look. Especially this guy. <laughs> He's just <laughs> He's just trying to copy Itachi, like what, <laughs> what is he doing? Huh? Kawaki and Code eventually come face to face, as we get to witness the decision Kawaki has made, deciding that his role is to carry everything on his shoulders by sacrificing himself for the sake of the village. For Kawaki, this is literally the best option for him. He's already unsure if the village truly is a place for him to stay, but he still wants to protect Naruto, and so offering his life is quite sadly the best of both worlds for him, as he won't need to worry about a place to return to if he's dead, and Naruto's life will also be spared. But of course, this isn't what Code wants. In fact, he finds it disrespectful Kawaki would offer such an option considering he was his god's vessel. Code and Kawaki have a lot of respect and devotion for the ones they look up to. Both are in similar positions, especially when it comes to needing power to execute their role successfully. Someone who does have the power he needs however is Boruto as he enters the fray, this time being able to control Momoshiki's powers for his own benefit without losing consciousness. The short skirt he has with Code does a great job at showing how creative these battles with Code can be with him transporting himself through his marks. However, Code gets pushed back quite a lot during this fight. In fact, he gets pushed back so much that he decides to just ignore Boruto and attempt to dip with Kawaki, but even fails doing that. And this happens like three times by the way. While these are small moments, they'll eventually continue to build up to show how really unsuccessful Code is at, well, almost everything. Unfortunately, things don't go too well for Boruto either, as Momoshiki eventually resumes control over his body. When Naruto catches up to the battle, Kawaki's worst fears are becoming more of a reality. This will be the deciding moment if Naruto dies due to Code and Momoshiki. He needs his own strength to rise to the surface, revealing his new karma that serves to protect the Hokage. As I mentioned before with the similarities between Code and Kawaki, this arc is all about finding the strength needed to grow stronger. While this seems like a good reason for Kawaki, Kawaki, we'll end up finding out how truly twisted Kawaki has become when he has the power he needs to fulfill his motivations. No matter the cost, he needs to protect the Hokage, and that's as strong as a reason as ever to get more strength. Kawaki is allowing himself to walk down a path that's also reminiscent of Ishiki, even having his abilities, as that's how much he's willing to put himself through to save Naruto. Whether he's an outcast, shamed, or has to commit questionable acts, it doesn't matter, as long as his reason for living exists existed, he'll continue to march forward. The battle that takes place between Boroshiki and Kawaki is 
okay. I just don't think it's anything too impressive or intense from what we've previously seen in the series besides the ending. The anime adaption of this battle is a bit lackluster at times as well, but there are a couple of really great shots lined up here. I would definitely give it a watch either way since it's not much to sit through. It has some callbacks to the final Naruto vs Sasuke fight and while I guess they're cool, it's just not really necessary. I also don't find it fitting that Kawaki performs such an advanced ninja skill of using someone else's hands for a hand sign. Sasuke's use of this was much more in character, but for Kawaki, someone who had only just recently ventured into the shinobi arts, it feels a bit out of place for him to be using such a skill so soon. This fight builds up to the big climactic finale of Boruto allowing Kawaki to kill him to put an end to Momoshiki. If you didn't believe Boruto was ready to die for the cause before, then here's the definitive proof you needed. It is a bit unfortunate that all Naruto does in this conflict is sit on the sidelines and react to what's happening. I understand him not knowing what Boruto and Kawaki were planning, but it feels like the story is emphasizing him being way too weak after Kuroma's death to do remotely anything of significance. In a way, it feels like the story doesn't really know what to do with Naruto until it's time for him to be out of the picture indefinitely. What I do like, however, is showing how detached from reality Kawaki's been in this situation. No one else matters but Naruto. Who cares about the bonds he built along the way? If they're a threat to Naruto's life, he takes action. It shows how he doesn't even agree with Naruto's mentality that allowed Kawaki himself to survive and live in the first place. Instead, Kawaki sees the flaws in Shinobi and how they work. Speaking of flaws, Code gets absolutely overwhelmed by Kawaki once the opening to fight arrives, having to rely on someone else to get him out of this mess. And so, Code didn't really accomplish anything by coming here to battle, taking nothing but loss after loss and learning information that only put a halt to his plans. The conversation Naruto proceeds to have with Shikamaru is a tricky subject to unravel. Naruto can't give up on Kawaki, otherwise his words up to this point would have been a lie only to suit his preference alone and no one else's. But we can see how taxing this is on Naruto because it isn't any normal situation. His son's corpse is lying in his hands growing colder by the second. Even Shikamaru questions if that's how Naruto truly feels. As Naruto lashes back in anger to try to conceal his pain and not give in to the emotion he hates the most. Giving up on people. Until... Boruto returns. Thanks to Momoshiki's assistance, Boruto lives to see another day. However, it's not for the better. In fact, it's worse. Due to Momoshiki rewriting part of his resurrection data into Boruto, Boruto's otosukification has been completed. While Momoshiki can't exactly revive himself due to Boruto's sacrifice, Boruto is now ready to be fed to the Ten Tails by code, meaning the hunt still continues. The story has taken a dramatic shift for both the main stars of the next generation, especially when it comes to the relationship they share. While their bond is strong, it also feels incredibly fragile at the same time, as all it takes is one hindrance to flip the script completely. This marks the end of Code's assault arc, and it actually marks the end for the Boruto anime too, as this was the point where it went on hiatus. While making this video, the Boruto anime has not returned so I can't say anything about the future of the anime from this point on. All I do know is that the break was very much needed needed. I'd much rather the staff have a lot of manga content to work with. Rather than bogging down the series with uninteresting fillers that range from having amazing art and animation quality to then the lowest I've ever seen in anime. Overall, I want a good level of consistency and for the anime to show its best work during the most crucial of moments in the story. For example, I mentioned before how I thought the Boroshiki vs Kawaki fight was okay but I did wish the fight got a much better treatment. Obviously, no disrespect to those who worked on it because there is some really great stuff here. I understand it's for the most part out of their hands due to a tight production schedule which isn't anything new coming out from the anime industry. But until the anime returns, let's continue looking ahead with the manga. All that's left is one final arc to wrap up part 1, at last leading us up into the time skip that has been teased to death since the very first chapter. So with that being said, it's time for the final arc of part 1, Boruto. So
So I'm gonna start things off with a little bit of a rant here, but bear with me. Something I've noticed a lot with these recent chapters is how much they just regurgitate information we already know. The writer wants to make sure the other characters are up to date, yet feels the need to retell every detail of the story. It's really not necessary, especially since we as the reader get nothing new out of these characters when it comes to their reactions. Why not just skip right to the end or the moment when something new is brought up, to further add to the event that just happened? Otherwise, it's honestly just a waste of pages, which is really frustrating, considering this manga releases monthly. It's not exactly ideal waiting another month, where a good chunk of the latest chapter is recapping what happened previously through uninteresting dialogue. Even when binge reading and not putting into account the monthly release, I still found myself getting frustrated. Thankfully, this arc kicks off pretty much immediately, as Shikamaru confronts Amado to make him spill the beans on the secrets he's been keeping. Before much can be said, however, Cohen makes another appearance due to him placing a mark on Shikamaru. Thankfully, Shikamaru was aware of this all along and admits it was just a ruse to bait code out. I'm glad Shikamaru's intellect hasn't been nerfed as I was starting to worry a bit. We then see a new model of Delta appear, this time being under the command of Konoha. For code, he once again finds himself in a sticky situation, but thankfully, Ada joins in to make life much easier for him. During all of this commotion, we get a small teacher-student bonding moment between Sasuke and Boruto which I really love. Especially with Sasuke's words, as he says he doesn't like the negative role Kawaki has taken up, elaborating that the village doesn't need to hate anyone else but himself. It shows he still carries the heavy weight from his past on his shoulders at all times, accepting that everyone will always have a rightful reason to hate him. Some really small yet great details to show the after effects of the long character arc Sasuke has gone through and how it still affects him to this very day. He also acknowledges how similar Boruto and Kawaki's brotherly trust and acceptance is to the bond he shares with Naruto. Immediately after allowing Boruto to keep his headband since it helped with his resolve, Sasuke says a worrying line that it might be his turn to show his resolve next. And Sasuke isn't wrong, because as we see in the future, Sasuke has arguably the most important choice to make that dictates whether Boruto lives or dies. There's a dialogue straight after this with Sarada and Mitsuki about how they've been, well, left out. As Sarada says, they're just that undependable. Of course, I am exaggerating if I say I truly believe this, because they do have their uses. It's just that they're not really doing anything. They just react to what Boruto's going through and say it's time to get stronger. Mitsuki is especially laughable due to how little he's contributed. We also get a reminder of Sarada's dream, but again, it's just Hokage is strong, so I need to be strong. Even though in the original Naruto series, we saw Naruto undertake more responsibilities than just simply being strong that made him fit for the title of Hokage. Would be nice to see more of that from Sarada besides this overused dialogue from her. Moving back to Sasuke and Boruto, there's another scene I actually quite like. As Sasuke is alerted about Code's presence in Konoha, and when Boruto asks what's going on, Sasuke could easily just tell him to stay behind. But to show how much Sasuke acknowledges Boruto's resolve, he informs Boruto about the situation and for him to come along. The bond between these two really shows, especially with Sasuke accepting Boruto. I'm always happy to see these two on the page together. Meanwhile for Kawaki, he does some heavy reflection upon how he feels about his karma. Instead of looking at it in disgust, for the first time, he's grateful for its existence. This karma saved Naruto's life, but on the other hand, it ended Boruto's. Kawaki doesn't mention Boruto at all in this conversation, however, focusing purely on this great power that has proven its worth of protecting the Hokage. This is the strength he needs, as Kawaki continues to spiral down this dark obsession for power, believing it to be for the greater good accepting that this is the role he needs to fulfill, even if Naruto disagrees. Heading back to the center of commotion, Shikamaru is able to fend off Ada's ability even if he is rendered practically paralyzed due to using all of his willpower to fight it off. It's funny in a way because this man is really, really trying to not fall for her. Tamari still remains the only woman who hasn't wrapped around her finger. Ada then proceeds to inform Shikamaru about her true motive, confessing her feelings for Kawaki in hope of experiencing a true romance. And so Shikamaru offers her the proposal of a lifetime to join Konoha in order to have a better chance at meeting Kawaki on good terms. This, however, isn't something Code wants to hear, as he would end up being in another sticky situation, losing one of his most essential assets if Ada accepts this deal. And I can't help but laugh at this scene of Naruto trying to enter the code for the room in the midst of such a desperate situation. And to make it even more ridiculous, Shikamaru tells him not to blow the door down with jutsus because of the 
the village's budget being low. That is such a ridiculous and dumb excuse to not have Naruto enter the fray. Shikamaru's reasoning for not wanting him to fall under the enemy's power is good enough, not all this extra nonsense. Surprisingly, Inu is actually the biggest MVP in this situation due to Ada not being able to read their minds. Really great supporting character for the Boruto series as a whole because of her clutch technique. I'm glad she's still committed to her ninja lifestyle while also balancing out the other passion with working at the flower shop. Code and Ada then proceed to flee back to their base with Amado in possession, continuing the interrogation for Code's limiters to be removed. Amado in a way mocks Code's torture plan and how even that will fail. And what makes this small disc great is that Code just looks more like a fool, especially since Amado isn't built on the shinobi life of dying with information. He'll spit it out as long as he lives. It's a bit of a comedic sight, especially with Code just getting frustrated at how stupid Amado is making him look. Nevertheless, Code manages to secure his first win anyway by having his limiters finally removed. Code's overwhelming confidence is automatically shown after this too, as he says he feels like he can't lose to anyone. It's funny, considering it can be compared to someone who lost non-stop in a game for 10 matches straight to then finally get their first big break and act all cocky. Code's moment of victory would be painfully short-lived however, as Ada had made her decision to break things off with the alliance they formed. But due to the rush of gaining his first win along with his newfound power surging through his veins, he ends up biting off more than he can chew, believing Ada only needs him to protect her. Yet Damon quickly puts him in his place through a completely embarrassing one side smackdown. Even with all of this power, Code is still shown to be inferior. And this will turn out to be a big hit on his mental state, as for him, it'll feel like nothing has truly changed. But Kawaki is a different story. Not only has Kawaki gained the power to change things, but he's also gained the affection of Ada. Just like being Ishiki's vessel, Kawaki has taken everything from Code once more, as this accumulates to what's possibly the peak of Code's driving force as a character. This kind of character building is what I absolutely love, because even though Code has been a pretty weak villain both physically and I guess story-wise, you can just tell it's leading up to an even bigger payoff for him to leave his mark, no pun intended, on the story. He's completely focused on making sure his losing streak ends here. It was now his time to take back what was rightfully his. Heading back to the village, we once again see Kawaki's confidence and attitude grow, so much so that he starts insulting Shikamaru which is pretty funny. There's also a much needed scene showing how Boruto's situation is affecting those around him. Not everyone can be as strong and walk it off. And so seeing Hinata break down in tears about the possibility of never seeing her son again makes the situation feel all the more dire. These moments are what makes the characters and the predicaments they're in feel real and less robotic and one dimensional where the only thing in mind is to march straight towards the main plot. No, these character moments are 100% needed. Boruto's response of promising to come back home also creates an eerie atmosphere, as Momoshiki even comments on it to ridicule Boruto about how even a simple promise like that is one that can't be guaranteed at this point. The promised day where Boruto loses everything is rapidly approaching after all. After this, there's a small scene of Himawari talking to Hinata about the possibility of herself becoming a ninja to help loosen the burden Boruto is carrying. Perhaps an indication of Himawari becoming a full-fledged shinobi after the time skip? I'm almost certain this is the direction it's going to head towards. I'm aware the anime did do a short arc about Himawari in the Ninja Academy and actually becoming a ninja, but in all honesty, this arc is not interesting at all and I wouldn't recommend watching it. You're not really missing out on much. Meanwhile with Code, we see him with a much calmer mindset even after everything that's happened. And Code's response is actually perfect. He says because things are actually okay. And while if we do look at all he's been through, this is something we could quickly disagree on. But when thinking about his original mission and the path he's on right now, he's actually correct. His limiters have been removed and he has a plan to deal with the Tentails. Despite the shaky start, everything is still going according to his original plan. And with this, we get to see a proper overwhelming impressive feat of what Code's capable of. Using his claw marks to wrap around the Tentails and shrink it to a size that best suits his purposes. That's when we get our first look at these more humanoid Tentails pieces. The designs remind me of Frieza a lot, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were based on him due to Ikimoto being inspired by Dragon Ball as I've touched upon throughout the video. Skipping forward to how Konoha are gonna deal with Ada and Damon, Shikamaru hatches a plan to basically put Boruto and Kawaki under house arrest with them. Honestly, it's not the most interesting plot development and at the time I dreaded this going on for too long, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Even so, watching everyone spend time together in a house 
feels like a reality TV show isn't the most interesting concept ever. However, with Kawaki and Boruto being so close together at all times, we get to witness firsthand that all Kawaki sees is Momoshiki when he looks at Boruto, leading to him taking out his frustration on Boruto for the smallest things. But now it was time for Ada to make her introduction and enter the mix. It's interesting seeing Mitsuki's first ever reaction experiencing quote unquote true love. I did like the scene where the others say it might be best to move closer to inspect the situation, to which Mitsuki replies about how much of a great idea that is. It actually got a good laugh out of me. Speaking of good laughs, no surprise here, but Konohamaru is still just as pathetic as usual. I get how he would fall for Ada like everyone else, but having it this dramatic to where he knocks himself out and falls down the stairs? Come on. Even Boruto can't help but comment on how ridiculous it is. Again, we get more redundant recaps of character abilities and situations. Whoever's in charge of the dialogue, whether it be Kishimoto or someone else, just keeps wasting pages with this stuff. How many times do I need to be reminded of Ada and Damon's abilities? Just skip past it when talking to other characters and get right into the new details. When we do eventually get to the juicy bits of new information, we end up getting an absolute bombshell from Amado, revealing the pinnacle of godhood, Shibai Otsutsuki. Shibai's remains are the powers that Ada and Damon possess, and imagining such power in one individual is crazy as we really go all out here when it comes to scale, to where even the abilities he would perform are only comparable to that of divine miracles, truly building up Shibai as the real omnipotent god of the verse. Amado even discusses the possibility that Shibai has ascended to an even higher dimension where his body isn't even required. So I'm assuming this makes Shibai four dimensional? It's a lot to take in. During this talk, we also learn about some of Amado's past with his daughter who died of an incurable disease. I don't know if this illness is related to maybe what Itachi had, but if by chance it is, this could present a good opportunity to perhaps delve into that mystery that was never properly explored. Though for right now, that doesn't happen, and I don't ever fully bet on us coming back to this discussion focused on the illness. Overall, the backstory is short with explaining how Delta is, but also isn't, Amado's daughter. He wasn't able to properly clone her, and so a different result would appear with no signs of recapturing her humanity or what truly made her his daughter. I do like the realisation he has about this being a playing field humans just aren't supposed to cross nor understand, which is often what a lot of the characters in Naruto learn the hard way when attempting to access the power of the gods. It's also understood that the main reason Amado implanted the karma back onto Kawaki is so he can revive Amado's daughter. Yet it begs the question if that's something Kawaki would even go through with at this point, since he believes he needs the karma more than anyone else at this moment to protect the Hokage. Got to mention how Shikamaru continues to be the most realist character in this series. He doesn't trust anyone unless it's a 100% guarantee. His harsh mindset is definitely needed when a lot of people like Naruto can be too relaxed about all this. Momoshiki also starts to make his presence a lot more known from now on, to where we continue the cycle of more questions popping up to every answer we get, as Momoshiki reveals how Ada's powers aren't exactly Otsutsuki related, adding once again another lie Amado is possibly trying to sweep under the rug. But the most interesting part of this segment of the story is Boruto getting a glimpse into his own future, something Momoshiki belittled him about not being able to see for himself near the start of the series. This future, however, was much closer than he thought. But for the meantime, it was back to discussing youthful romance with Sarada, the class rep, and Ada. We dive into a more interesting aspect regarding Ada finding her ability to be more for curse than anything else. A similar set of circumstances Kawaki used to be in with his karma. It begs the question if the conclusion for Ada's story arc will follow a similar path due to the parallel she already shares with Kawaki. More on that once we reach the end of this arc. Yet the most interesting aspect about this situation is how class rep and Sarada aren't affected by Ada's charm. It's most definitely connected to some type of personal love since this arc, as well as Ada's character, is all about love and obsession. But it presents an unlikely pair to possibly stand up to Ada in the future. Meanwhile, Kawaki notices Boruto's strange behaviour, and due to Kawaki being on high alert, he automatically connects the dots that Momoshiki lives on inside Boruto. For Kawaki, it didn't matter what reasoning Boruto had. For the Hokage's sake, he had to die. This is the pinnacle moment where everything changes. However, Kawaki can't make that change just yet, as there's another problem that must be dealt with first, this being Naruto. Shikamaru's advice is probably what leads to Naruto's eventual downfall here, as he says Kawaki needs to think this time before he acts. And he does exactly that. But 
before this moment was to arrive, there's an interesting scene between Damon and Himawari where Damon acknowledges her strength, or more so her untapped potential. It's hard to know right now because nothing is shown, but these past chapters have been making sure to include Himawari a lot more than usual. There could also be the chance that Damon is confusing this intense aura with love at first sight, which he doesn't understand yet, but who knows. Only time will tell, but I do expect to see some type of change in Himawari's involvement for the story going forward. But now, it was time for the good stuff. The conversation Kawaki has with Naruto and Hinata is probably my favourite dialogue exchange in the entire manga. Kawaki really just lays out all his cards on the table and speaks the truth. Such as how Naruto gave him a reason for living, but unfortunately, that's exactly what makes people like Naruto die first. As Kawaki says, it tends to be the good people who meet an early death. Or rather, the concept of being a shinobi is what makes these people die. Kawaki is basically telling Naruto right to his face that the structure Naruto has built isn't going to work in this generation. And Kawaki's openness to how failed everything is continues with what's possibly the most gut-twisting dialogue Hinata and Naruto could possibly hear from him. Do you know what my first thought was when I found out Boruto was alive? That I'd failed to take him down. I even felt a sort of guilt over having messed up. It actually surprised surprised me. Kawaki's brutality really doesn't hold back, as we can also see it's his words that carry a heavy amount of weight to them and not just his physical actions. He's no hypocrite, he's not blind to the actions of the shinobi world, but also himself. He acknowledges how the choices he's made have personally affected him, but in a less sympathetic and more so twisted way than what we're used to. Hinata's words and actions mean absolutely nothing to Kawaki, because he fully understands the person he is and the role he must fulfil. It didn't matter whether they understood him or not, because Kawaki understood himself, leading to him sealing away Naruto and Hinata until this world is safe for them both to return. This seems to be the place Kawaki was referencing at the start of the time skip, yet more questions are still left to be answered. Kawaki said he'll send Boruto to the same place he sent Naruto, but obviously with Momoshiki present within Boruto, that wouldn't make much sense to send him over there. I like how even though we've gotten one big piece of the puzzle figured out for this time skip, there's still multiple areas that need to be filled in. Once Boruto hears the news regarding Kawaki's actions, he rushes home to see the situation for himself, but ends up getting intercepted by Kawaki. A short skirmish takes place, but what I really got excited for was Sarada joining in for backup. This is one of the things I wanted to see from her, to step up more without being instructed by someone else. But this moment of excitement was short-lived as Boruto dives in to protect her from Kawaki's assault. And it's like, why? What's the point of her being here if she wasn't going to do anything to begin with? She was ready to fight but then just stood there? All she does is prove Kawaki's words right with Shinobi being the one so eager to run to an early death. Because I mean, if they all act like Sarada, then yeah, he's right. And it's a pretty basic attack on top of that, no tricks whatsoever. Just walking straight up to her and beginning the motion of a strike. It's super hard to believe she couldn't have dodged it, let alone activate her Sharingan? It seems she forgot she had such a useful ability. This fault in Sarada's actions results in Boruto getting a scar that was seen at the start of the time skip. So I guess we get the answer to that too, but I don't know. It's just such a boring and pretty anticlimactic way to get this battle wound when your friend was literally standing still in front of you. But this wound on Boruto quite literally marked the start of the end for his destiny that was about to befall him. And even with the issues I've had with this arc, I was so excited to see what would unfold, as I truly wasn't prepared for what was about to take place next. A wild manhunt then begins, as the entire village was in search for Kawaki. Tensions high on all sides in regards to how he should be dealt with. Ada wants to support him, Mitsuki and Shikamaru prefer elimination, while Amado doesn't want the boy who holds the key to reviving his daughter to disappear. The first person to reach him however was Ada, witnessing Kawaki's true emotions flow out right in front of her in what was basically a cry for help. Kawaki is convinced that killing Boruto is deep down the right thing to do for Naruto's safety. But that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. At the end of the day, he was still an outsider while Boruto was the Hokage's son. As strong as Kawaki is, in reality, he has absolutely no power in this situation, and that's been the case since day one. Something needed to change, and for Kawaki, his wish gets answered by Ada. This leads into the biggest twist of fate that has ever come out from the series. The grand reveal of Ada's powers 
switching the lives that Boruto and Kawaki have lived out to this very moment. As of right now, the roles have been reversed. And as a quick note, I really like how this could be possibly seen as a callback to what Naruto said to Sasuke back at the 5 Kage summit. Boruto had lost everything, while Kawaki had gained it all. He was now seen as the Hokage's son, while Boruto was just an outsider. What I really love about this moment is how this power works hand in hand for both Ada and Kawaki. Ada is built on love and obsession, and just like what we've seen from Kawaki, love can make you do crazy things. Kawaki and Ada are both tied together in this theme, and I like how they both benefited from the worst attributes they hated about themselves in this situation. Ada used her powers that always hindered her life to protect someone she loved, which was Kawaki. While Kawaki being an outcast benefited him greatly when it came to switching his life with Boruto to protect the person he loves, which was Naruto. I think this was honestly one of the most tragically best moments for both characters. And just when you think Kawaki's playing this couldn't get any dirtier, he forces Ada to inform Konoha that Boruto killed Naruto. I think another detail that makes this moment more scummy is Kawaki placing his hand on Ada's, as he's more than aware of her feelings for him and deliberately takes advantage of this position he's in. Now fully realising just how much power he has in all this, he even gets pretty forceful later on to make sure things will go his way which ends up backfiring on him later, as Ada isn't as blind to love as one may think. Momushiki's prophecy had at last come to be. Those blue eyes, meaning Ada's eyes this entire time, did in fact take everything from him. Due to Boruto's role in all this being swapped with Kawaki, he gets his first rude awakening to this new cruel reality when Mitsuki enters sage mode ready to fight him. I will say though, it's pretty disappointing to see Mitsuki go sage mode for the first time in a Boruto manga this late in the game, as it all just feels like a shock value moment to show the repercussions Ada's power has had on Boruto's comrades. Mitsuki's sage mode isn't being used that greatly in the story, and it kind of sucks. Focusing more on this turning point however, when it comes to the Naruto series, we're awfully aware that prophecies and destinies can be changed. The start of this change was Sarada and Class Red being unaffected, continuing to build up their role for the future of the story when it comes to being the only hope of counterattacking this divine power Ada carries. But the most important player in this critical moment would be Sarada. I do wish she was the one who figured out the situation first, because I just expect her to be more on her toes considering she's the one who's taking part in more shinobi duties compared to class rep. But I guess her being such an emotional mess makes sense for what comes next. Seeing everyone around her, even her father, say how they're going to suddenly kill Boruto is absolutely mind-breaking for her. And the build-up to this is actually pretty good as we see Boruto being called a monster by his best friends, as all he can do is run, not being able to bring himself to fight back. Momoshiki constantly belittling Boruto is also great, trying to convince him to switch places as Boruto is not only fighting an uphill battle physically, but mentally too. Meanwhile, the same can be said for Sarada's mental state too, seeing the gravity of the situation continue to weigh on her as she begs for her father to listen, being the moment where she awakens her Mangekyo Sharingan. I'll be honest, while I do understand this being a proper circumstance for her to awaken, I just can't help but feel there's something missing to make it more satisfactory, especially if we're comparing it to previous awakenings in the Naruto franchise. I do think there just needed to be a bit more build up to it because as I was saying before, I did really like the direction it was heading in with showing how severe the situation is for Boruto. Maybe showing more scenes of Boruto being ambushed and struggling to put up a fight while cutting back and forth to Sarada would have done it for me. But this awakening does make sense with the context in mind as I've seen some really bad takes from people who believe she shouldn't have awakened here. She just witnessed Mitsuki attempt to kill Boruto, nobody besides class rep is listening to her, Naruto has been declared dead, her own father is on his way to eliminate Boruto, all while imagining how terrified and alone Boruto must be feeling with the whole village hunting him down. It's not an understatement to say this is a lot for someone like Sarada to take in. As I said, the pieces are most definitely there, they just needed to be presented better. What I do love about this though is Sasuke's reaction. Seeing this awakening first hand, he understands immediately how absolutely serious this situation is to push his daughter to such a state. And even with his mind saying no, his heart says yes to trust his daughter, deciding to take the leap of faith and save Boruto. He also addresses some of the obvious flaws in this switch. Boruto is carrying Sasuke's headband, which in Sasuke's mind is something Kawaki should have. And Momoshiki is also in Boruto, Sasuke under the impression that he should instead be locked inside Kawaki. We as the reader can also pick up on a few obvious flaws to this 
this predicament, like Boruto being named similar to Naruto while also having whiskers on his face, making it hard to believe the rest of the characters aren't noticing these glaring features that should make them realise of course he's Naruto's son, he's his spitting image. These things don't get mentioned despite how painstakingly obvious they are, but Sasuke kind of answers this by saying how these issues bother him less and less due to how strong Ada's ability is. Whether that's something you accept or think it's a bit of a shaky way to cover up such obvious things is up to you to decide. That is how brainwashing works at the end of the day. Yet for Sasuke, he chose to devote himself to believing in his daughter. I need to reiterate how strong of a character moment this is for him, as his mind is going to be constantly fighting with itself that Boruto is the one that killed his best friend. Yet Sarada's plea is what Sasuke will be hanging on to till things get sorted. In fact, it's more shocking for Momoshiki as this was clearly a future he couldn't predict, to where he even tries to remind Boruto of the predicament he's in, attempting to break that mental fortitude he seems to have inherited from Sasuke as Boruto just keeps his cool, leading to Momoshiki being the one to break down instead at the reality of the situation. I've always loved the back and forth between them both and how they prey on each other's downfall. It makes for some good interactions. Another final surprise is when Ada takes the time to approach Boruto, confessing her guilt over this situation he's now in thanks to her. Just like her normal powers, this ability of hers wasn't something she could control. She knows all too well what it's like to have people's minds flip around, a life of lies. Though Boruto doesn't dwell on his position too much, in fact he feels sorry for Kawaki most of all. He sympathises with him even more so now after coming to understand the position he's been in this entire time. And it just so happens that this situation isn't unique to just Kawaki, but Naruto too. Naruto was also in such a position where the odds were against him, but he pulled himself up with his own strength and achieved his dream of becoming Hokage. As Sasuke's words about Naruto is a callback to his pep talk to Boruto in the first arc. There's quite a lot of callbacks in this finale, such as Boruto calling himself a shinobi after tying up his headband, similar to what we saw in the time skip preview. And Momoshiki even says things weren't supposed to go like this. Boruto has changed his own destiny, just like his father. And like father like son, he wasn't going to end this fight by killing his brother, as he instead needed the strength to put things back into place and end both of their suffering for good. After all, that's exactly what Naruto would do. This means it was time for Boruto to show that resolve once more. It was always his story, now having to prove this right now more than ever before. And with that, Sasuke plans to leave the village with Boruto, taking on the familiar role of being a rogue ninja that he knows all too well. But this time, with the intention of returning when the time was right. And this marks the end of part 1 Boruto. I've spent a lot of time discussing my thoughts on each arc of the story, so I'll try to summarise my final thoughts as quickly as possible. The best final question to answer is this. Does Boruto deserve all of the hate it gets? The answer is quite obviously no, however the series does rightfully deserve its fair share of criticism just like anything else. It's clear there are parts of this series that just do not work all that well, especially coming off as a sequel to one of the most popular and successful manga to ever touch the world. I've seen people online try to damage control any criticism by saying it's not Naruto. Boruto is its own series. And to give them credit, they're half right. Boruto is its own series, but at the end of the day, it still and always will be connected to Naruto. Everything you see in this manga all belongs to the Naruto universe that has continued to expand since the very first chapter of the original series. Of course, Boruto isn't like Naruto in every aspect however, especially when it comes to the creation process like we touched upon throughout the video. Kishimoto clearly took more of a backseat as a supervisor, not taking full control over the writing until chapter 52. Meanwhile for Naruto, Kishimoto was the heart and soul of that manga. With the main creator wanting to step back more when it comes to the sequel, it's only natural that not everything that made people fall in love with the original series will be inside this manga. This is why Boruto feels so different. 
different and for a lot of people that's scary and worst case scenario upsetting. I know people who are diehard Naruto fans that really wanted to love Boruto but the series just didn't captivate them like Naruto did. As a Naruto fan a certain expectation is already made when starting Boruto. The expectation to love it. Boruto is different but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Sure, in some cases this can be bad, however I can confidently say I really enjoyed my time with the series. Did I enjoy it as much as Naruto? No. But did I need to? No. Being a fan of something does not mean you have to unconditionally love every single thing that relates to it. The expectation is there, sure, but who cares if you don't? I don't like every Naruto movie, nor every Naruto game. So with Boruto, I don't love it as much as Naruto, but I can still appreciate it for what it is. It's not perfect, nothing is, but... I don't care. Despite its problems, I stuck with the story from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 80. And now look at me making my longest video ever on the channel dedicated to the series. Boruto is great. And by me spending the time to make this video, I hope my passion and love for the series has been made clear despite the issues I have with it. I'm looking forward more than ever to part 2 as I have a lot of high expectations for the direction the story and its characters will head towards. I'll be back to finishing up talking about Boruto once once it reaches its conclusion. But until that day arrives, for now, this is it. This is the ultimate retrospective for Boruto. And so, that's a wrap for this video. If you've made it all the way to the very end, then wow, I really can't express my gratitude enough. This project was a massive undertaking and I'm aware the length of the video may have put people off. But whether you stuck all the way through or only watched certain parts, then all I have to say is this. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this behemoth of a video. I also want to give a very special thanks to my friend Harsh Reviews who edited all of the flashy AMVs you saw throughout the video. He saved me a lot of time and the final result was better than I could have ever imagined. Please make sure to check out his YouTube channel if you're ever interested in seeing some great anime analysis videos. If you did happen to enjoy what I talked about today, then please show your support by giving the video a like, hitting the subscribe button and turning on the notification bell so you can get notified when I drop my next video. It's for free and it lets me know you're enjoying my content. So if you're at least a slight bit interested, you might as well stick along for the ride. As well, do follow me over on my Twitter, or I guess X account, at MikeYubi. It's the place where I'm most active, so if you want to message me over there, then feel free. My Discord server is available down below in the description to join also if you wish to hop in and chat with not only me, but as well as many others from the anime and manga community. And of course, please do comment below in the video if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Whatever the discussion is, I'll make sure to check it out. And with this, thank you all so much for watching the video to the very end. Hope you all have a great day and bless.